Hey, uh, good morning or good evening or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're at internationally. This is Matt Parker, also known as Double Tap. And uh, we also have on the line as a guest speaker, Ned Tibbetts from Mountain Education. Uh, Ned and I did this first PCT Sierra webinar last week, and we actually overloaded the software system. Uh, I can only have 250 people join max, and 280 joined, tried to join. So we decided it would be good to do another one, not only for that reason, but also for our international hikers um, to do it at a more conducive time frame. So hopefully 8 a.m. Pacific time works better for, for everyone else in, in Europe and Asia. So we'll jump right into this. Um, it's a pretty open forum. Feel free to ask questions via audio anytime, or you can go into meeting burner here. There's a little chat box down in the bottom left, and there's also a, a Q&A box. Um, and then you can also, all right, you see there's a question from Willie wondering about layering for this section. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, Willie, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. But what we found out was that as we were doing the last webinar, uh, we had many, many questions coming in through the chat box. Keep them coming. Um, depending on how many we get, we may be able to hit them as we go along, or we may reserve those till later at the end of the webinar as, as we don't want to get derailed too much. There, there's a lot of slides to go through here. There's a lot of topics to talk about. Having said that, we'll jump right into the agenda. So we'll show you some. I, I got some very new snow data as of yesterday showing the snow levels in the Sierra through mid-March, so, so that was good news. I'll um, also talk a little about Southern California and the high desert because there are areas where you, you will hit snow. A lot of people don't realize that. Talk about special gear uh, that's needed in, in, in the Sierra and potentially Southern Cal. Uh, Ned Ned will be, you know, jumping in a lot, chime in. Yep. We'd be tag teaming this thing, um, you know, especially when it comes to questions about snow safety, as Ned is, is definitely the expert in that. Um, also talking about maps, which I think is you know, always important, but even more so this year because you're going to need more than just your half-mile maps. Talk about exit points in case you get up in the Sierra and, and you just decide, hey, this isn't for me. But we're going to spend a majority of this webinar is on the high Sierra passes, especially the, the first five that you run into in Kings Canyon National Park, uh, the first of which is the infamous Forester Pass, the highest point on the PCT. Talk a little bit about a one pass per day strategy, um, times of day to, to, to get up and over the pass. And the, there's a lot of these slides are just photos of the passes, so we can kind of give you an idea of, of what it is you're going to be seeing and strategies to get up and over them. Talk a little bit about flipping strategies and, and the challenges you're going to have this year. Um, a very important topic is water crossings because um, they, they could be quite challenging and, and potentially dangerous uh, given the high snow we've had this year. And if there's any time left over, we can talk about resupply, but um, I think we'll, we'll probably save that for another discussion. And of course, Q&A as, as, as we go along. It'll probably come up though, Matt, since it's all part of the Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the big thing about resupply, um, you, you just have to keep in mind that a lot of the roads going up into the Sierra this year are going to be opened a lot later because they're snowbound. Um, for example, Highway 120 going up into Tuolumne Meadows, where a lot of hikers send a, a resupply box to Tuolumne Post Office. So the, the 10,000 foot overview on resupply strategy is you know be flexible and be ready to call audibles and you know try to get in touch with the trail angel at home. He's sending you these boxes, let them know, hey, I found out this road isn't is, is closed, so maybe you should send it to a to a town lower that hopefully you can hitch to or walk down to a place where you can't get a hitch to. It's going to be a very dynamic changing situation this year because of the, the high snow level. Um, just some general comments here. This, this presentation will be down. You can download it from the PCTwater.com website. So half mile and myself, we, we, we maintain the, the water report and I have a, a slide to talk a little bit more about that. I've, I've changed these slides a little bit, so give me about a day to get the new ones up onto the PCTwater.com website. There's also a link to the webinar recording that Ned and I did last week at PCTwater.com. And as a matter of fact, I'll just show you. So if you go there, this is the PCT Water Report. Up in the upper right-hand corner are links to the YouTube videos, not only for the Sierra, but also for the Water Report. I, I did a few of those a few weeks ago. And you can download the PDFs here at these links. So uh, some high-level comments. This is a very unique year. You guys are probably already well aware. 
it's we're on record to have our second wettest winter um, ever in recorded history. But while there, we we're on track to exceed the 1982-83 winter, but uh, I don't think we're going to quite hit those numbers. So that's somewhat of a silver lining. However, there's still plenty of winter left. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Ned and I are in Reno right now. And I woke up this morning, looked up my hotel room, and I see a, a light dusting of snow in, in the mountains <laughs> of the distance. So it looks like we got some snow last night. Um, so we can still get some more. I've been wandering all over the Reno Tahoe area this weekend and went up to Mount Rose, which is on the eastern flank of the Sierra. And, and I've never seen the snow banks that high before. It's it's pretty crazy. Um, Ned will will talk about you know it might be a little safer and easier to start earlier this year before the thaw hits, <laughs> which is uh, kind of counterintuitive to what I originally thought, but you know it can make sense now that he explained it to me. Um, one important point is that your daily mileage in snow is reduced drastically about one mile per hour. So you're going to, you're going to hit the Southern Sierra thinking, Hey, I can do, you know, 20 plus miles a day, like I've been doing in, in the, in the SoCal high desert. Well, that's just not the case. You, you slow down um, drastically when you're on snow. Also, you'll see multiple sets of footprints. Um, we'll talk a lot about mirror pass later on, which to me is probably the most confusing of the passes and you'll see 10 different footprint paths and you're like, well, which one do I follow? Well, we'll give you some strategy on how to, how to tackle that. Already alluded to the roads up to the PCT are going to be closed a lot later. So just keep that in mind for your resupply boxes and also for, you know, hitching out to a town to take a zero. Um, all the photos that you see in this presentation were taken during my PCT 2014 through hike. Um, but there's a big caveat here in that that was a very low snow year. Um, but you can kind of see in the background here, this is on the southern side of Muir Pass. There was still you know, plenty of snow up there, but you're going to see a lot more than what you're seeing in these photos. It's just the only point of reference I have, so I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what it's going to be like. Um, there's lots of unknowns. A lot will change. You know, I always tell people, have a plan, but be flexible and adapt. And, um, you know, call audible, audible as you go along the way. You know, before I move on, though, uh, Ned, maybe you want to say a few comments about the the thaw and might be safer and easier to start a little earlier this year than usual. Yeah, and maybe I can uh, start out with some some ground terms like we did last time. Um, when it comes to entering the Sierra, um, don't be particularly too shy about it. Uh, anytime after April 1st, which is kind of the date um, since uh, I've been teaching snow skill safety for 35 years and have been in the Sierra from April to September, most of all those those uh, years. Um, April 1st is kind of the landmark you use for kind of the end of winter and the beginning of spring as far as, you know, at altitude, at the trail altitude. So um, that's when the snowpack, uh, I consider it to be consolidated. So there's your first term. Consolidated snow means that it's settled, it is compacted uh, under longer days of sunlight, uh, um, maybe some rain events, that kind of thing. So the whole thing is settled and hardened, yet the nights are still freezing. So there's the second point. As long as the nights are still freezing, the thaw hasn't happened. Your morning snow will be nice and hard, easy to walk on, swing your feet, that kind of thing, as long as you have traction. Uh, third point, so carry a traction aid or some kind of uh, chain-type uh, micro-spike thing or hiking crampons so that you don't slip on that morning hard, crusty snow. We don't typically get what you would call ice in the Sierra. Um, there may be runoff uh, from melting snow during the day that trickles down whatever exposed trail you may have um, and then freezes overnight. So you might have like glare ice, that kind of ice uh, in trail beds, but not on the snow. So if you're walking on the snow, the snow surface can be crusty, but not icy. So traction devices like the two I just mentioned are um, perfectly fine. Let me underline a point. If you will be in advance of the herd, so to speak, um, or a person who looks at those footprints in the snow that Matt was talking about and they're like going all over the place because hikers don't know, you know, if I don't have a trail in front of me, I don't know where I'm going. So, oh, my God, let's just wander through the trees here. Um, and you have an idea where you're going, and you're going to be stepping out of somebody else's footprints to make a beeline in the direction you want to go, you might want to be bringing hiking crampons because they, are, uh, they provide a greater degree of safety on steep snow, especially on steep traverses where you need to use the edges of your shoes to dig into the crusty, hard, um, pre-thaw uh, snow surface. 
Um, once the thaw starts, and this is like around mid-May, typically, um, but has you know it varies. Obviously, you can't predict mountain weather. So like last year, it was the end of May. I think it's going to be late this year, but I could be wrong. Um, once the thaw starts, then you have less time during the day to be able to walk on top of the snow before it gets so soft that you start falling through, or what we call post holing which not only is exhausting and fatiguing, but actually can cause a great deal of injury, not only to the things that you may scrape by uh, as your foot and leg punch through the surface hard snow and into the softer stuff underneath, uh, you may, your leg may scrape by boulders and trees and branches and tree trunks and stuff that's buried in the snow. So people typically will um, use their tall hiking um, gaiters to add a little bit of a protection to their lower leg. So usually by about mid-morning, say 11 o'clock, after the thaw has started, which means it's no longer freezing at night and you're starting to hear water running under the snowpack and, and uh, where you used to be able to walk straight over the top of creeks because there was a big, solid, frozen snow bridge, now uh, those snow bridges have collapsed, you see open water, you've got to figure out how to get over that kind of thing. So. Um, it's a whole different scenario. The snow will get softer earlier, and we'll get into this in greater detail later, I'm sure, Matt, about going over the paths and logistics of timing. But those are some of the, the little kind of um, terms I want you to remember. You know, um, uh, consolidated snow versus powder snow. Powder snow will stop you in your tracks. It's very hard to get through, so therefore don't be up, in, up near northern um, Washington. Uh, late in the season when powder snow arrives again, and stops you, uh, stops, stops you dead in your tracks. So um, powder versus consolidated, thaw versus uh, pre-thaw, and so forth. So it kind of gives you a time frame to think about while we talk about everything else. Yeah, and as you can, guys can tell, you know, there's no 100% answer <laughs> for, for a lot of these questions. Um, the weather changes. Every year is a little different. This one's unique just because of the high level of snow. And that's why we're trying to arm you with as much information as possible so you can make wise and, more importantly, safe decisions when right. you come to a fork, a fork in the road, for, for lack of better terms. But um, moving on to the – I want to talk a little bit about the water report because it's, it's, we're, we're broadening our scope to help you out with the Sierra section this year. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the water report, it's, it's a very you know, straightforward tool, basically. You go to pctwater.com. You can come in here and click on any of these sections to pull down, you know, information on water reports. I, I did a webinar on this. So I'm not going to go into detail. But one of the things we did add is the Sierra Snow and Ford report. So if you click on that link, pull up the PDF page, <clears throat> you'll see basically we're going to have updates for all of the high passes and all of the, of the creek fords um, pretty much in all of section, you know, G, H, I, and J, um, I might even add a little bit, well, yeah, up to K, maybe even more, because even getting into sections L and M north of Tahoe, you're probably going to hit snow. Also for Washington, too, because one thing to consider is that Oregon and Washington also had a high winter. I mean, pretty much the entire West Coast got clobbered this winter. Um, after five years of drought in California, we needed it, but unfortunately it hit, hit you guys during your, during your through hike here. So as you're sending in water updates, um, for the Southern California section, when you get to the Sierra and when you finally do get cell signal, which is which is pretty sparse, although you can't get it up on some of the high passes, which always amazes me, send us updates on on the passes, you know, the, the, the creek fords. Photos are great, especially for the especially for the passes and the fords. And one of the things that I've added to the Facebook page is PCT Water and Fire Update Group, which I'll, I, I moderate. I'll probably change the name to Water, Fire, Pass, and Ford Update Group. I'm um, starting to consolidate. <laughs> yeah, starting to consolidate all the photos into a photo lab. I was literally just doing that this morning, and I'll do the same thing for the passes of the forest because I want to give you guys a one-stop shop or a two-stop shop between the Facebook page and the and the water report, so you can actually see what these things look like. Uh, to me, a photo is worth a thousand words, especially when it comes to the passes and the fords. Um, I'm sorry. Is there a question? Okay. Uh, for, for everyone who's not speaking right now, if you could put your phones on mute, that'd be great. It just helps to reduce the background noise. Um, obviously, there's no water report for the Sierra section because especially this year, you won't have to worry about water. Um, but Half Mile and I, we update the water report several times a day between peak hiking seasons, which we I classify as April through November. 
although there's already a lot of guys out there right now on the trail. And this includes for the Sobos. A lot of people think that they get forgetting that they're a Sobo, but we, we're not. We're updating it every day. We just don't get as many updates, but it's more important for the Sobos, especially as they get to Southern California, for the guys behind them. Um, talked about the Facebook page. It's really important when you guys send in these these updates, whether it be a water, forward, or pass you know, report, to include the mileage points, which are halfway mileage points, and the date that you're there. All the mileage points you see referred in this presentation all go back to half, half miles PCT maps. So you can either post on the Facebook page, you can send us an email here, you can text or call the same number. You got four avenues to send us updates on the trail. I do ask that you do choose one of these four uh, mediums to send us an update because I know I'm friends with a lot of you guys on Facebook, but I travel a lot for my day job. As a matter of fact, I'm on the road today in Reno, and sometimes I don't get to the water report until late at night. Um, by half miles checking during the day. So if you send it to one of these four, one of us will see it you know, before the other and we'll get it up on the report as fast as possible so that you have the most current information. Okay, so enough of that. Uh, talking a little bit about the snow, I, I always like to show some data to, to back up our claims here. And you can see th these are graphs with, for the north, central, and southern Sierras. Basically what you have there in the baby blue is what we consider average snow year. Snow year. Uh, the, the bottom blue is last year. The red is our wettest winter in recorded history of 1982-83, and the dark blue is this year. So per my earlier comment, we were on track to exceed 82-83, but it, it's starting to taper off a bit. I mean, it's, it's, it's a small silver lining, but nonetheless a silver lining because there's still just a ton of snow up there, but at least it won't be the worst year ever. A little bit about Southern California snow. There are four sections on the trail where you will probably hit some snow. Mount Laguna right off the bat is 42 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. It's very, very common to get snow storms up there around 5,000 feet. Mount San Jacinto, which is near the Idlewild area where a lot of hikers take their first zero. Idlewild is a great town. It's like one of my favorite towns on the entire trail. But you're right on the flanks of Mount San Jacinto, and it's very common to get significant storms any time before, anytime before Mother's Day, which is May 14th this year. Uh, good news is that there, there is an Outfitters in Idlewild, so you can buy you know equipment if, if you get hit by a snowstorm. But this is this is a pretty challenging section, um, as you know, not to scare you, but there was a PCT hiker who died in 2005 up there. It, it can be pretty dangerous. I, I highly recommend don't go up on the trail if a storm is hitting. If you go up right after, go by the outfitters and ask them, hey, you know, do you think I need ice axe, crampons, whatever. Um, this is where the infamous Fuller Ridge is when you start that 8,000 foot decline from almost near the top of Mount San Jacinto down to the Cabazon Pass. So it's a long way down and, you can hit, and you're always going to hit snow on Fuller Ridge. In 2012 and 2014, both low snow years, there was snow on Fuller Ridge. Big Bear up in California Section C is very high up in elevation, right, 8,000, 9,000 feet, so you can always get snow there. And then Mount Baden Powell in this area right here um, after the, the Cajon Pass. But the good news about that is there's a highway up there called Highway 2 that goes along the spine of these mountains, and L.A. is yeah, just about to do. Yeah, it's a good point because you don't have to go up on the trail, and they'll close down that highway um, <laughs> usually when they get any kind of snow, at least in, in the history I've been up there. And you can just follow that highway because the trail will cross the highway seven times. Um, so it's just a good bypass if you don't want to go up when there's a lot of snow. Talk a, a little bit about special gear here. So I know a lot of hikers typically only bring, you know, micro spikes and an ice axe. And I, I have some, some links in here, you know, just for ones that I recommend. Doesn't mean they're, they're not the only ones. Um, however, this year, I, I know Ned, you know, the next slide is actually on Ned's uh, classes that he offers. Um, Ned recommends a whippet and crampons, so maybe you can take a few minutes here, Ned, and talk about the difference between the two and why you think whippets and crampons are, are better. Um, yeah, good idea. Uh, but, Matt, why don't you – you want to f um, take Jennifer's question about the uh, 2010 snow line on your graph? Um, where is – oh, with the, baby, with the baby blue line on the snow report – show accurately for 2010. I don't have the 2010 slide here, but I know that was our last big Sierra snow year. Um, I saw on track of this year, though. I could be wrong, but Ned, maybe you remember? Well, where we're at right now, they're saying, you know, like, I think I saw 187% somewhere. Um, 
we're, yeah, about there. we're 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 dropping down to the the 2010-2011 winter. Um, neat thing about that was, or even the whole thing is, uh, I was doing the Tahoe Rim Trail just to show that it can be done on eight feet of snow, and uh, this is in June and July, uh, in you know obviously Tahoe, and um, it doesn't make any difference, guys, how crazy the charts read. Uh, how much snow is there? Oh, my God, all the stuff that you're going to hear on the porch of Canyon Meadows General Store, you know, it's like, oh, what are we walking into? It doesn't make any difference. Once you get up to the snow, walk on it. It doesn't make any difference if you're on 20 feet or 2 feet. So what matters is the condition of the snow. Is it soft? Is it hard enough to support my weight? That's the main thing. So don't freak out about um, um, how hard or how, I mean, how much is there. The other thing about that is the more snow, though, the longer it's going to hang around. So that's the problem for John Muir Trail folks and people who think that they're going to go up into the Sierra, you know, July and have, you know, the wonderful dry trail summer they've known for the last, you know, eight years, whatever, you know, because we've had so many drought winters. So yeah, the snow, when it's deep, is going to hang around for a long time. doesn't all melt out, you know, 30 feet or whatever. It's Mammoth is amazing. Um, so, uh, the snow is going to be around, you know, into September, if not later, at least, uh, 2011 it did. Uh, when I first started mountain education in 82, um, I had no idea it was the heaviest winter on record, but it looked normal to me because those are the kind of winters we had in the sixties and seventies and so forth. Um, when I was skiing in the Tahoe area and you, you drive up on, on highway 80 over Donner summit and it would just be a tunnel kind of like you know big steep walls of snow on either side and it's just the way it was so we thought that was normal and yet in the last several years we've had very dry winters and we've all kind of gotten lulled into the fact that <clears throat> well in june you know you have dry trail and well that's not the case normally june typically okay here's some more information for you um typically may okay so we we established the date the first of april is when the snow becomes consolidated and you can walk on it. Avalanche dangers are largely gone unless you have at least a foot of new powder uh, land on the old surface. And then of course that can slide if it's deep enough. So um, we won't, I'm, there's too much to talk about as far as avalanche safety, but just keep in mind, once the snow is consolidated, you don't have to worry about it unless there's a significant new powder that lands on top of it. Um, June though, in May and June, you can have snow line so here's another word the snow line is the lowest elevation where you have solid snow solid snow meaning there's snow everywhere you don't see any boulders or logs or dry ground to stand on below snow line you'll have patches of snow uh, even a patch of snow if it's on a steep slope and you have to cross that patch of snow covering the trail <clears throat> you can slip on that and end up broadsiding a tree down below you and, and break ribs and hit your head and do all kinds of nasty things that are going to require you to be flown out and that's the end of your summer. So be wise and carry traction devices and two poles and we'll get into the whole thing on as Matt led into about ice axe versus whippet and, and micro spikes versus crampons and junk like that in a second but just wanted to say that your snow level in May is typically down around 9,500 feet and in June it's like around 10,000 feet uh, July, it can be around 11.5. See, it's after the thaw, so you're going to have a little more acceleration in, in the snowpack thinning. When, it, when the snowpack melts, it doesn't like just disappear. It, what it does is it recedes in altitude. So where your snow line was 9,500 and the thaw starts, uh, you know, a couple weeks later, you're going to run into snow now at 10,000. A couple weeks later, maybe 10.5, something like that. So it recedes to the higher, steeper stuff where it's going to be even more scary to be on. Um, you know, anybody can walk on, on flat snow, at least relatively. It's not quite like walking on an ice arena. If any of you guys have tried to walk on an ice arena in your regular shoes, it's like, holy cow, I, I don't have any traction anywhere. Uh, and that's why um, it's so difficult to, you can't push off your toes when you're on snow. Um, it, the, 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 your gait, your hiking gait is completely different because your feet want to slide out to the side. So you're using more of your inner thigh muscles and you're going slower. You're also edging a lot more. You're using your ankle muscles to force your shoes on one edge or the other. So uh, anyway, okay, Matt, so should I dig into the ice <laughs> Well, I, I tell you what, so, so as you guys can tell, Ned has a wealth of information <laughs> on, this, on this topic. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll, I'll bounce back and forth between this slide and the previous one, but 
you know, maybe you can spend a, just a few minutes talking about the classes you offer, because I think this year, especially the PCT Novo Snow Advanced class is very pertinent. Um, and by the way, guys, I don't make any commissions on anything I recommend here. I'm recommending a lot of different things. But I, it, if I was hiking this year, I would be taking Ned's class. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of taking it because I just want to learn more myself. But um, maybe you can spend just a few seconds talking about this class and just kind of the things that you offer because I, I think they get benefits from that. Okay, where do I di where do I dive in? Um, we okay. Uh, there's always too much to say, so. Um, what we've always we're a, we're a public charity 501c3 nonprofit mm -hmm. wilderness school. So what we are here to do is to try and educate and train people um, about the hazards in the mountains, uh, what to prepare for and how, and if there are any skills involved like creek crossings and going up and down steep snow and stuff like that. We offer these classes. If you haven't been able to take our snow basics course which uh, these are taught during the winter on powder snow. So it's kind of not all that relevant to the through hiker who's going to be on consolidated snow. Um, you can attend an advanced class. Just because it says advanced doesn't mean, okay, what are the prerequisites? You know, I got to do those first. Oh, crap, I didn't get the basics done. I don't qualify. That's not true because you've done 700 miles, <laughs> you know, plus all the other hikes you've done in your lifetime. Um, to get to the course that starts uh, at Cottonwood Pass, 40-something, uh, 50-something miles north of Kennedy Meadows. And this is Kennedy Meadows South, uh, obviously. Um, and so you can attend this thing. Now, what, what it's all about is I, um, it's not a guided thing. We're, we teach you what you need to know and what you need to do to stay safe, find a trail, not get lost, not fall down and crash into a tree, uh, not not slip crossing a creek, all that kind of stuff, where the hidden dangers are beneath the surface of the snow, stuff like that. We teach that all, all to you as we hike with you from Cottonwood North up, up Whitney. And for everybody, everyone wants to go up Whitney. So we go up there and then over Forrester. And then we say, um, you know, we part company at the Charlotte Lake, Kearsarge Pass Junction. Some people go north on the PCT. Some people go out Kearsarge for a resupply. Um, and that's great. That's the end of the, the seven-day trip. So the idea is that you don't lose your, your time and your mileage. Uh, we join you on your through hike and teach you all you, you, uh, you need to know. Um, yeah, and I think an, an, important point, an important point here, sorry, Ned, is, um, that I didn't no quite make indic indicative is that you go over Forester Pass. In, in in your in your Novo Novo class, right? Which everyone yeah. I get a lot of questions about that. What's the ice shoot look like? You know, it's the highest point of the PCT. Yeah. And to me, right there, that experience is invaluable. It's the first crazy pass you're going to see. Um, it's probably the steepest thing. It's going to look like it's straight up and down, especially when you get in the chute. But I've measured it with a with an incline meter. And that thing's only about 45 degrees. But 45 degrees is like you're standing in it, you're looking down, going like, I couldn't ski this. I couldn't stop myself if I fell down. I'm going to die. Um, so that's why we get out there, and uh, with every one of our trips through, which is every week, we ref refine and clean up a, a trail that we cut through the snow across this, what is it, Matt? It's probably about 100 foot wide or whatever, 80 foot hmm. wide chute. And, very. <laughs> uh, yeah, it varies. Depends upon the temperature and the, and the thaw and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, um, what I wanted to say uh, though is we used to offer snow a uh, southbound um, advanced courses from Hearts Pass up to the border to teach everybody who's going southbound how to be safe on snow because the North Cascades guys, if any of you are going southbound, they're very steep. Look at your topo maps and look at all the switchbacks going in and out of those creeks and up to the ridge and then back down a creek and up the next ridge. That's all steep stuff. Now, if the top of the map shows green, obviously it means there's trees. If you're on steep snow and trees, it means if you fall down and start tumbling, you're likely to crash into a tree and break something. So um, that's why we offered the class. However, the Forest Service up there in its infinite wisdom has decided that even though we're teaching on snow, uh, we're having an effect on the uh, impact on the environment, and it is a wilderness area, so they won't allow us to teach up there. So um, we're not doing it this year. We'll have to figure out that, that sort of thing later. Uh, you want me to get into that, Matt? Um, I, well, I, I think we should try to keep it high level for now. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Let's have, I, I think it's good that you oh, spend sweet. a few seconds talking about between the difference between ice axes and whippets, because this was new yes. to me, too. 
Um, I, you know, the both years I hiked, I carried an ice axe, even though I didn't need it. But this year, I know you recommend to whip it. So maybe just give them the 10,000 foot overview on what the difference is. And I have a picture of a whip it here to kind of explain it. I think it's okay, the same cool. one you recommend. Yeah. I mean, there are a couple on the market. Um, Gravel. I think Gravel makes one. And basically, it's a, it's a regular like ski pole with an ice axe top on it or ice axe pick on it. And the more rigid the whole assembly can be, the better. Uh, the Gravel has a, um, a hinge on its, on its pick so you can fold it down into the handle and get it out of the way. And, you know, that, it's, it's stupid because there's a weak spot. Um, maybe they, in their infinite wisdom, also thought that it might be a better marketing deal than to have the thing out of the way, but whatever. So the Whippet made by Black Diamond is the one we particularly like uh, because it is uh, a rigid assembly. If at the end of your uh, last patches of snow as you're going northbound, which <laughs> may not be folks until Washington this year, uh, as it was for me in 1974, I had snow all the way up to my last week before the Canadian border, um, you may be using your Whippet all the way. Now everybody goes like, oh my God, this thing's a little bit heavy. Well, not really. And won't your arms get, you know, strong? And you, you probably won't even notice it after a couple of days. And, and yes, that's true. So don't balk at weight, especially if it's, you know, in your hand. It's not a big deal. Uh, people ask questions about carbon versus aluminum. Remember that carbon has uh, strength in one direction. So it's great for um, just stabbing your pole straight down. But if that pole goes into the snow and then you lurch forward because the snow is now soft and you're losing your balance, trying to catch your balance, the thing will probably bend right in half. The aluminum ones are stronger. Okay, so let's move on. The point for having it, um, and you don't, in this case, then need an ice axe. This thing, the, the first premise is you want to prevent your fall. How do you do that? You control where your head's going. You control where your weight is going. Where's your weight? It's in the upper part of your, part of your body. So if you have two poles in your hand, you, can, you have better lateral balance. So you don't want to have, like, unless you're a mountaineer and you really know how to use an ice axe and you can, you can see the risk ahead, you can stop and take off your pack. Okay, I've got to get my ice axe out. I see this problem up ahead. It's, you know, icy, steep, whatever. Most through hikers don't know how to identify risk. And this whippet allows you to have your ice axe in your hand all the time. It's not on your pack. So if you suddenly have a, you know, a, a slip that generates into a drop to your knee and kind of start rolling down the hill, you don't have to realize, oh, crap, I left my ice axe on my pack as you tumble down the hill. So it's always in your hand. There's your advantage. The two advantages are it helps you maintain your balance. You've got two poles, one in each hand. And uh, if you do decide, or not decide, but it accidentally happens that you fall, you've got your ice axe for self-arrest. Self-arrest is something that needs to be learned, um, and it needs to become reflexive. You need to be able to go into the self-arrest position and stop your fall, your tumble, as an automatic reaction. Um, so when you guys get out there, if you don't take this class, uh, take a class somewhere. Go to a ski area and say, hey, any of you ski patrol guys, you guys know how to do this. I don't particularly care whether you sign up for our class. I'm not doing this for the money. This is, a, like I said, a public charity, nonprofit. We're doing it so that you guys are safe out there and know what to anticipate and then how to, how to deal with that. Uh, yeah. You should it, do it for now. Yeah. Yeah. And on that point, uh, maybe spend a few seconds talking about, you know, crampons versus micro spikes. Cause I know yeah. the, the overwhelming trend with through hikers is micro spikes. And, and for the guys who don't, don't know the difference. Uh, so this is your typical crampon right here that you see in all the mountaineering movies. And this is the micro spike that a lot of us have used. Um, you know, I used on my through hike, even though I never actually put them on my, my, my shoes because I didn't have a lot of snow. Um, so maybe just talk about the differences and advantages and disadvantages over the other. Yeah. Um, maybe, Matt, while I'm yakking, uh, can you find out what the exact weight difference is between the two? Or if that's too much, forget it. doesn't make that much difference. But <laughs> uh, what I can try, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What a height is, the, is they, well, they, they count their grams, and I understand that. But when it comes to your safety, consider durability and design over weight because it, it is your life. Now, the micro spikes are a little bit lighter than, I'm just going to stick with Petula. They make a good design. Um, than their hiking crampons. But the main difference, it's, God, what is it, four ounces or something in difference in weight. Um, the length of the, the, the points, we call the spikes the points, 
length of point is a little bit longer, but that doesn't make that much difference. What matters between these two from a sta safety standpoint will occur to you as you're on your steep traverses. Any place where you see switchbacks on your map that's above 10,000 feet, probably this year for June, you're going to be on snow. Those switchbacks are gone. What do you do when you, you're looking straight down this hill, down to like Wallace Creek, Wright Creek, Crabtree Meadows, all of those creeks that you've got to drop into and you think, oh, I'm only going to have steep snow on the passes. No, you're going to have steep snow on any of those areas where you see switchbacks in the trail and you've either go, got to go up or down that. Crampons are, are designed where your foot stands on a frame, not a chain system. Um, and because, and this is the main deal between the What's the other manufacturer? Hillsound, I think. And there's some other manufacturers of hiking crampons. There's a big difference. But yeah, if you could keep that picture up, Matt, of the, of the Cthulhu um, hiking crampon, uh, there's a big difference between uh, climbing crampons, which is the stuff that you see in the movies. You know, the guys are towing in straight up the ice waterfall or whatever the heck they're doing. They have two points that stick out in the front. Now, these two points go down. It's not designed for towing into something uh, like like ice, where you've you got to have these points out in front. The problem with hiking with climbing crampons or any kind of crampon that has two forward points is that those points can carve into your other leg, your Achilles tendon, your, your lower leg muscles, your skin, and cut them up really bad. So those who are trained in climbing know that when they put their climbing crampons on, that they've got these knives sticking out the front of their toe. So they, they're very careful about where they put their feet. Snow hikers aren't so much. They're swinging their feet like they were in Southern California. Now they're on snow. So get crampons that don't have forward points. These don't. And also, if you'll notice in the very sort of center of, of the crampon, there's a metal frame that comes up the side of the shoe. It's shi shiny silver. Maybe Mac can point at that thing. That is sorry, crucial. We'll That's, right, that shiny silver band right behind your arrow? Right, right there? There. There. Nope, that's on the bottom of your shoe. It comes up the side of the shoe, right beside the big toe. There's a, there's a metal band that rises, that one right there. That's what makes these things safe. Because when you're on a steep traverse and you're trying to, uh, uh, to hold on to the mountain, your foot wants to slide downhill. What is your foot going to slide onto? Because the crampon is going to dig in. Your foot's going to slide into that piece of metal. If that piece of metal isn't there, like on the hill sound, where's your foot going to go? it might slide out. That would be a disaster. And that's what happens with the micro spikes because they don't have a frame. You can roll out of them. So what we used to do is we used to incorporate our boot laces. So you see this red rubber band. Okay, that's cool. It goes on really fast. You know, it's really convenient. You talk to Cthulhu and you say, well, hey, why did you guys design this? And they'll tell you, well, we designed it for people walking around on ice, on icy sidewalks, maybe some crusty, icy, run, you know, com competitive runs. That kind of thing, you want lightweight in the feet, you know, that sort of deal. But you're on the flats and maybe a little bit of up, a little bit of a down, but certainly never going across. So these weren't designed for your steep traverses, which you guys are going to be doing. And so what happens is you, you, you roll out of them, you slide right out of them. You're, as your shoe wants to go sideways, as you're cutting across this hill, the, the spikes dig in, the, cramp, or the uh, micro spikes stay there, and your shoe just slides right out the side. Um, even adding your shoelacing we, 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 or, a, or a strap going across the top like the new ones are trying to do, that didn't work for us. We still slid out of it. We product tested these back in 2010 and, and complained to Cthulhu, and they said, well, it wasn't designed for steep traverses. So anyway, that's the nutshell. Um, you want to have uh, your points as close to the edge of your shoe as possible. Obviously, these are right down the center or fairly close. True also for the hiking crampon, but... The, um, the key for edging, I've been talking about edging, the key with edging is not, at your, it's not going to come from the crampon, it's going to come from your shoe. Because you see in this picture, what's on the very edge? Not, there's no spikes. It's the edge of your shoe that's going to be grabbing onto the hill. If the edge of your shoe is soft, like a trail runner, it's just going to smear against the hill and turn into a ski. So, so and, down you go. And going back to your earlier question, it's about an eight ounce difference, at least for the, the micro spikes I'm looking at here and the crampons I'm looking at in the other tab. So eight ounces get, gets you, <laughs> it buys you a lot of, a lot more safety is, is the nutshell. So yeah, yeah a, 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 lot, a lot of decisions to make, uh, but you know, take one of Ned's classes and you, you need to learn everything you need to know to be safe up there. 
Um, in terms of bear canisters, um, not really for, for snow safety, but for bear safety, <laughs> um, I get a lot of questions about bears from, from everyone, not just through hikers. Oh, they're going to eat you. No, they're not going to try to eat you. Uh, the good thing about, about this trail is we don't have grizzlies on it, especially in the Sierras. Um, however, it is legally required in Sequoia National, between Sequoia and Yosemite for about, you know, 250 miles here to carry a bear canister. And I, I have a link for the one I use. I mean, it's the only one out there, but it's, you know, you got to have a big bear canister where you're going on these long stretches between resupplies. Um, and Ned actually informed me uh, earlier last week that it's also required in Desolation Wilderness, which is in the Lake Tahoe area. From okay, got a so qualification. I got okay, that qualified or clarified today or yesterday. Um, because bears are becoming very numerous in Tahoe, and basically where the bears are going to be, they're going to be wherever there's food, wherever there's people. If you're on the PCT through Desolation Wilderness, north of Echo, between Echo and, and Donner, not so much, but they're out there because it's one of the most visited wilderness areas in the country. So what they're saying now is we strongly encourage underlined on your permit that you bring bear canisters and not an earth sack or hang your food. Um, I was just up there a weekend or so ago, and you can see these old ropes hanging from, you know, tree branches up high and stuff, and they're just like shattered, you're not shattered, but uh, torn and ripped up at the bottom. Obviously, the bear got to the bag, and they just left the rope up there and went home. Um, it's not required, but it's strongly encouraged. As a matter of fact, our snow trips this, this spring, we've had to carry bear canisters uh, just because they want to see that uh, you're in compliance with their standards, which are largely the summer standards. Um, but where are the bears going to be? They're going to be down in the garbage cans. They're going to be down around the houses. They're going to be down in the campgrounds in the city dump. So uh, they're not so much on the trail yet. Um, you still need to bring these things okay. or else you're you know, going to get in trouble. Good point. So, but, but one point is it's legally required, and they will check you. Um, I, I backpack a lot in the summer in Yosemite and Sequoia, Kings Canyon. Um, I, I've never had it checked so much in Sequoia and Kings Canyon because it's rare that I run into a, a ranger backcountry there, but it's possible. But in Yosemite, I've had it checked multiple times. And often what, they, they won't ask you to explode your pack um, <laughs> unless, you're, unless you're in a bad mood. Um, I, I keep my bear canister at the bottom. Make sure that they can, they can feel the hardness you know, yes. from your backpack from the outside. You know, just tap on or whatever. Because if they can't feel it, they're going to make you explode your pack, and that's the last thing you want to do in the middle of your hiking day. Um, new in this year, it is required in Lassen National Park, which is in Northern California between 1344 and 1363. Uh, the caveat here is that it, it's only required if you camp within the park. And you can see it's only a 19-mile stretch. Um, elevation gain really isn't that bad in, the, in this area, so you can blast right through and not camp in Lassen. Uh, reason behind that is that there was a, a pretty aggressive bear last year who was trying to get the, the multiple hikers food. So it you know, wasn't going after the hiker, but definitely wanted the food. You know, you probably, all you guys have probably read Yogi's book and heard everyone say, you ship all this special gear to yourself in Kennedy Meadows South. That's pretty much the, the gateway to the Sierra. During a normal year, you could ship it, you could ship the ice axe and the bear canister back from South Lake Tahoe. However, this year, I, I think you're going to need you know, some of these items, if not the bear canister, further north because there's just going to be more snow later in the year. Let's let's add in the comments about Sonora Pass uh, Snowfield, if I may. Uh, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys will will decide, oh, gosh, you know, I don't need my, my ice axe or my whippet or I don't need the traction aids, uh, micro spikes, crampons, whatever. Uh, after Yosemite, you know, they're just maybe seeing patches of snow. It's getting pretty easy. Um, Sonora Pass, just north of Yosemite, has a snow field that is fairly sizable and steep on the south side of the pass. You have to go down this thing to get to the pass, and it has caused a uh, great deal of uh, PCT hiker injuries in the pass because there's some big boulders at the bottom. So don't ship home your self-arrest device. Yeah, there you go. Um, until you get past there. Now, even in desolation, there's Dick's Pass. Dick's Pass can be a little bit like uh, Glen Pass, smaller version, but it's the north sides of things, like you see on this topo map that um, Matt's got up on the screen. Um, that's where snow will remain longer. So look at your maps the night before. You're having dinner. Anticipate where you're going to run into snow because it's on a north-facing slope, especially in trees. Trees will be shady, cooler, 
Snow is going to hang around longer. There is a great classic snow patch uh, on the PCT right before you get to Twin Peaks near uh, the ski areas of Alpine Meadows, Squaw Valley, on the west side of Lake Tahoe, um, just north of Barker Pass. That thing, it's shady in there. It's a tight little steep bowl, kind of like what I'm seeing on this topo right here. And just getting up onto that, you know, because a lot of snow drifts that are across the trail are going to be, you know, two, three feet, maybe four feet tall. Doesn't mean they're very long. So, you know, you figure, okay, I have five steps, I get across it. Well, just in those five steps, if you slip, down you go. And you're going to go right down the yeah. patch until you so, get stopped by something. So, yeah. Yeah, this is a good point because it, during a normal hiking year, a lot of hikers will, will get off here at Highway 108, which is Sonora Pass. They'll hitch to Kennedy Meadows north, so there's two Kennedy Meadows, you know, about eight miles west on Highway 108, and they could ship their ice axe back. Um, but this year, I wouldn't do that. Um, there's also a Sonora Pass resupply, who I believe will come right up to the pass and, and resupply you, you know, with your box as long as the, the road is open. But just north, of Sonora Pass, there's another patch that I ran into in 2014. It's 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 just right about mile 1020 or so, and this was that was in a low snow year, and it, it turned out to be kind of a challenging snowfield for me to go down. Um, this year, I think it's also going to be pretty big. So, you know, the key point here is don't ship your ice axe and crampons back from Sonora Pass because I think you're going to need them as you move north. Okay, so I think we I think we've exhausted the uh, the special gear <laughs> slide here. Um, you know, Ned, of course, ha has his own mountain education website. Uh, he's on Facebook. Feel free to contact him with, with all your questions. Um, let's talk a little bit about maps and applications. So, of course, uh, you know, you got to have the half-mile maps. I just had them up. You know, they're, they're, they're priceless. Um, and half-mile also helps me maintain the water report. He's, he's a great guy. I, I also recommend uh, Tom Harrison maps, and you know, there's many maps out there. You know, I don't, I'm not saying this is the only one, but I just like them because they're very detailed. They're tearproof. They're waterproof. I mean, you, you could you could put those things to the ringer, and you will not destroy them. The one that I recommend um, as a bare minimum: get the Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks, because you're going to need to see maps that that have a wider scale, especially if you're if you get into a situation where you need to exit. Half-mile maps are great, but they're very narrow scale, so you can't see, you know, okay, what's off to the west, what's off to the east, you know, in a, in a good distance. There, there's a whole family of them that you can buy. Um, you know, Yosemite is also a good one to have. All these are between Sequoia, Kings Canyon, and Yosemite, which are, you know, the High Sierra. In terms of uh, applications, uh, Half-mile has, has a PCT app which is free. Guthook has, has an app, which I think only costs like, you know, $20 the whole thing. It's well worth it. Um, between those th those two, and also there's this new HikerBot app, which I personally haven't used, but the gentleman who maintains it told me that you can download off-trail maps on it. So that, that's pretty helpful, especially for exit points. Um, however, um, it's only for Android, not for, for iPhone, but he'll get he'll be getting that out later. The important thing here is we always we strongly recommend always carry hard copy maps with you. I mean, apps are great on your phone. You know, your phone's a one-stop shop for many things on the trail, but electronics can fail. Um, you know, sometimes you do stupid things. I, I knew a hiker who got into a spring. You know, he took a dip and forgot he had his cell phone in his pocket. Well, the phone was gone, and he didn't have any hard copy maps. So it, it's, it's strongly recommended to carry hard copy maps at all times, and also hard copies of the water report. We actually split up the sections of the water report to be where you could easily print, you know, from printers, say, like at the Idlewild Post Office or at the Softleys um, at the end of Section D in California. I, th I think you're setting yourself up for, for a very nasty day if, if you just bring your cell phone and rely on it. And then there's battery issues, too. I know you like, all you guys have solar chargers you put in your pack. Um, I personally carry portable battery chargers. But, you know, you're going to be out there for sometimes seven days at a time, maybe even eight days. depends on how much food you can fit in your, in your pack, and your battery will run out eventually, even if you keep your, your phone in airplane mode the whole time. A couple other thoughts? Go for um, it. All electronics. I don't care if it's phone, GPS, my satellite phone, whatever. They're also very sensitive to cold and when you're on snow, it's going to be a little colder. So um, moisture, cold are your, are your enemies there. Also, your, your field of vision, as, as Matt was just saying, um, if you're looking at a map on a little screen, yeah, you can scroll the map. 
But if you're trying to navigate on snow, see the premise here is that uh, if I know where the trail is going, in other words, I see the dotted line on the paper uh, or on my screen and I see the trail at my feet, all I got to do is follow this trail. Well, on snow, there's no trail. So your problem is going to be, where the hell am I on the snow? You know, I'm, I, I don't have any landmarks. I, I keep my map. My screen doesn't show me the bump on the ridge, and I can't find what well, on the map. So that's the problem. You need a bigger scale, a bigger picture, a piece of paper that will show you enough um, uh, uh, detail. And, and what I mean by detail is what your contour interval is in the scale of the map. Uh, I think long half miles maps are what? What's the con? Is it a thirty foot contour interval? I, I don't remember. Okay, you want about a seven and a half minute map, but that's that scale. But what I'm getting at is here, say you're standing in some some partially wooded drainage, in other words, little valley, you're climbing up in the Sierras, you haven't gotten a tree line, you don't know, you kind of got an idea that you're in the area of the trail. And let me underline this, remember this, it doesn't matter where you are as far as the trail. What you need to know is is where the trail is. I don't care if I'm to the left or the right of it. I don't have to be on it to feel secure. I just need to know where it's going, that it's near me. I'm paralleling the thing. And I'm constantly looking at landmarks around me and then finding them on the map. And then once I know where that landmark is on the map, then I know everything else around me and I can navigate. So if you have too, too uh, big a scale of a map, like you've got the whole park on your map, you know, I'm talking about Sequoia Kings. That's not going to show you the bump on the ridge that you want to, you know, you see, hey, man, the trail goes right by that, that big boulder up there. Well, if I can't find it on the paper, how am I going to know that? Uh, you know, so carry something detailed like half miles maps. Um, then carry something bigger like a Forest Service map, especially uh, up in Northern California and Oregon and Washington where there's a lot of logging. Every year there's new dirt roads. You come out on a road and you go, where the hell did the trail go? It's nice to have the current map published by the, the park or the forest that'll, that'll tell you, okay, if I go to the right or the left, I got 100, 100 yards. Okay, the trail's over there. They moved it because of the tractors, whatever. So uh, have a bigger scale. And also, and as far as the series go, if you have to bail, if you get hurt, if, if the weather just is pounding on your tent for days and you're running out of food and it's like, okay, I got to get out of here. Where is my closest exit? And I think Matt's going to get to that here with this slide up. But um, if you take that exit trail and you know you see it on the map and you find it kind of in general in the snow or whatever, and you follow it down, what's it going to take you to? What dirt road? What trailhead? Then you get down to the dirt road and it's like, well, where does this dirt road go? So carry also, like I do, um, a road map. You know, if I get out to the asphalt, which way do I go? Where the hell am I? So. I carry three different scales. That's just me, but um, been at it for a while. Uh, it's helped me for you know through emergencies. Yeah, it's a good point because and this 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 is just a Google Maps slide that I I took from the web. A lot of your exit points on the PCT in this here is going to be to the east because you have the Highway 395 corridor here that I'm showing with my mouse, and you can kind of see the PCT here in the dash line. And we have more slides coming up that talks about each of these potential exit points. But with these bigger scale maps, you can, you can see the paths to get over. And, and remember, if you go over any of these exit points, you're going up and then down, a significant ways down, to a trailhead. And then there's probably, you know, a three to four mile at least road walk to Highway 395. Maybe you'll get lucky and catch a hitch. But you won't see all that detail with just half miles maps. You've got to have broader scale maps. So when you're up in the Sierra, a majority of the exit points, if not all, will be to the east, except for maybe to the west, which is uh, Road's End. This is the road that comes into Kings Canyon National Park. Um, it's the only road, actually, that goes into Kings Canyon, which is why I like backpacking there so much. Um, that could be a potential exit point, but one thing to consider is with a snow year, this road basically comes up from Fresno. It goes up and then comes down into the canyon. So this section up here, is going to be closed later in the year because of snow. So be, yeah. it's one of those things. Yeah, I don't know when it's going to open. Um, the famous Kearsarge passes over here. And we, in the further slides, we'll talk more about those passes. Yeah, now Kearsarge will be open. They're, it's largely open all the time. Um, but yeah, like Matt said, we'll talk more about it. I want to add um, Cedar Grove at, land, at Road's End that Matt was just pointing to. That's the one I used um, right in there. That's the one I used in 74 because, remember, back then, 
we didn't have all this prep material and knowledge that, that you guys have today. So I just figured, hey, if I can get out to a road one way or the other, cool. Let's see if somebody can drive a box into me, resupply, that kind of thing. Um, and on, by, the, by the time you get over Forrester, it's all down Bob's Creek to get down to Rhodes End. So that was easy. I didn't have to go up Kearsarge and then, you know, drop down 4,000 feet or whatever that is to Onion Valley, um, which I certainly didn't want to come back up with a full pack. So it was a lot easier to drop down Bud's Creek. So don't rule out resupplying off the west side, but your routes out the east side will be faster. Yes. And if there's any way to get cell signal at the top of, of these high passes, which you can get from time to time, you know, call your trail okay. angel at home and say, hey, you know, hey, can you, can you, can you uh, find out is, is this road 180 going to Rhodes End? Is it open? Um, so if you can get that information, it'll save you a trip all the way down just to find out the road is closed potentially. So just, just to give you an idea of all the passes you're going over, you know, I count 18 if you, if you go over Trail Crest, which is a way up to Whitney. Just wanted to give you, you know, kind of a one slide that shows all the elevation. So you can see right off the bat, Forester 13,120, you know, it, you're pretty high up in Kings Canyon, which is all these passes through, uh, through Muir Pass. And it does go lower, you know, the further north you go. You're still going to have snow, though, on some of these passes. Ned was talking about Sonora Pass, which is, you know, below 10,000, but is notorious for holding a lot of snow. Um, there are a few exit points you might see on your map that may be, you know, of, of interest to you. For example, Trail Crest will go up to Whitney, but it also takes you down to the Whitney Portal. This is your least desirable exit point, because look how high it is, 13,646 feet. Now, I know a lot of you guys want to go up to the top of Whitney, you know, because why not? It's the highest point in the continuous United States. But the conditions this year are going to be more challenging. Uh, Shepherd Pass, it, you'll see that on your map. Um, that's not a recommended exit point in further slides here, but we'll talk about the ones that you could use as a, as a potential exit point. But one thing to consider, and, you know, Ned and I are going to probably beat this into your head until you're, you're, you're sick of hearing it, when you're approaching these passes, try to camp as high as possible to the pass. So, so that the next day when you're going up, you're minimizing your time getting up to the top. And more importantly, you're getting down the other side before it gets too hot and the snow becomes slushy and you start post-holing. Um, post-holing, for you guys who don't know that, is when you're walking on slushy snow and all of a sudden your foot will just drop through. You know, it can go just a couple of inches or it could go all the way up to, to, to your groin area. And it's, it's potentially very dangerous. As a matter of fact, I injured my, my foot on for, coming down Forrester Pass in 2014, and I ended up having a slight limp for the next thousand miles. I had to wrap my foot in athletic tape every day. It was, it was a massive pain in the ass. So if you can, the more you can avoid, avoid post-holing, the better for you. Another thing to consider is that after, late afternoon thunderstorms in the Sierra are common. Um, they can hit anywhere between yeah. 3 to 6 o'clock, sometimes, hell, when, when you're in camp at night. Um, the good news is that they're usually short. They're very strong, um, usually short. Sometimes they last a long time. But, a lot of wind. You know, exactly, yeah, and hail, too, and lightning. So, you know, you don't want to be on top of an exposed pass right when a storm hits. And I'm a, a good example of this because when I took this photo in 2007, literally 30 seconds after I took this photo, this storm behind me that kind of snuck up, it hit, and it was lightning and pea-sized hail, and I've never been more frightened in my life. So you don't want to be up there when it hits. So let's talk a little bit about potential exit points in Section G, which is the Southern Sierra. Um, the first one, and the obvious one, is Kennedy Meadows at mile 702. It's just you know a mile off trail. That's where you're going to send all your Sierra gear to yourself. Um, this is where you, you, you tend to get a backlog of hikers, and I think you're going to see that this year because it's, a lot of people are going to get to Kennedy Meadows and go, okay, I'm switching from desert mode to Sierra mode. You know, you're hearing all, all these all these all this information flying around. Some are true, some are not. And let's say you decide, you know what, I'm, the Sierras are just not for me right now. I'm going to you know, skip ahead to another section, which we'll talk about later, um, and come back to it. You could always hitch out here. Um, it's a fairly, it's, it's not a well-traveled place, but I think it's pretty easy to get a, a hitch down to 395 if you just put your thumb out long enough or talk to enough people. But once you enter here, it's kind of a point of no return, at least until mile 744.5. So you got about 40 miles where you have a, a your first potential exit point. Not to say that there aren't others. I know there's the Olancha Pass Trail, which I've never taken, yeah. um, so, so keep that in mind. But if yeah. you do decide to go... The hey, add, add that the Horseshoe Meadows Road probably will not open yeah. around mid-May, which it usually does due to, to snow and road damage. So don't count on being able to go out that. And even if you did try to go out that, 
uh, and you suddenly find, you know, you, like you heard the rumor, yeah, it's going to open. Well, and so you go down there, and you've got now a 20-something or 18-mile road walk banging down, you know, steep switchbacks on asphalt. It is not fun, and you're not going to have a good time. And probably the only people out there might be just the road workers. Yeah, you can get a ride with them at their convenience, but uh, I, I don't count on that, that road being open early this year. Yeah, so this was something that we learned during the first webinar we did last week. So what Ned's referring to here is Horseshoe Meadow, which is around mile 744. So let's say you decide you're going to proceed forth from Kennedy Meadows, and you get 40 miles in, and you're just like, oh, man, this is just not for me. I need to get out of here. This is another potential exit point. However, we learned that the road going down from Horseshoe Meadow, which you can see in the upper upper center part here, is significantly damaged this year, and we don't know when it's going to open. And that's a long road walk, 22 miles down to Lone Pine, oh, which yeah. is a pretty, pretty popular um, place to take a zero. And you can see Mount Whitney. You know, it's it's a big, big town on Highway 35 or big-ish. <laughs> um, but you know, if, if you have no other options, then you know this is something to consider. You could exit at Mulkey Pass or Trail Pass, which is you know right next to each other on the PCT right here. You go down into Horseshoe Meadow. It's a very, very big, wide open, you know, flat area. Tons of camping. Although when you guys are up there, it's probably going to be all snowed in. Um, so it is, a, it is a spot to potentially exit. But keep in mind, we don't know how how late that road's going to open going down to Lone Pine. Um, just past 744 and 45, there's also Cottonwood Pass. The trail kind of hooks around. That'll also take you down into Horseshoe Meadow. So there's really three points where you can get down to Horseshoe Meadow. The challenge will just be getting down to Lone Pine from there. Well, let's yeah. say you get up hey, there and you're like, I was just going to say, sorry, I keep cutting. I don't know how to interrupt you there. Um, sorry. Um, between Kennedy Meadows and Horseshoe, people have been asking me, will I expect to encounter snow there? Um, June, I expect the Sierra to be about four to six weeks behind schedule. So what you saw, like, say, one July 4th, you know, you went to the Sierras, you had nothing but dry trail and mosquitoes flying around. It was wonderful. Uh, July 4th is going to be happening then about mid-September, July, August, mid-August. So that would be that four to six weeks. So uh, if you're coming out of Kennedy Meadows uh, in June, it's going to look like May. What's that mean? It means that your snow line is going to be around 9,500 feet. So even looking at this map right here, and I'm trying to focus on elevation, it looks like Mulkey Pass is right about 10,000. You're going to have, in those 50 miles from Kennedy to Cottonwood, you're going to have a couple of places, yeah, Olancha Peak and this whole area that's on this, on this map. Uh, it's all going to be snow. And this is where people get really screwed up because it's all green. So they're, they know they're in the area of Horseshoe. They're getting close to Cottonwood. They can almost taste the fact that they're at Chicken Spring Lake and going to start my class, but they're now like freaking lost, like between trail pass on this map, um, down near the bottom in the center kind of trail pass, and then you go around the north side of Trail Peak, that's where people get lost. Keep in mind now, I mentioned north aspects of hills, the north-facing slopes of a hill, that's where you can have even more snow, and what does it say? It says that it's like 10, 8 or something in elevation. Um, yeah. You got to learn how to navigate in trees. That's where it's really bad. So bring a GPS or something that will show you where you are relative to the trail, because you're not going to have any sign out there like blazes on the trees or or, or, or man-made signs. You know, that's it's a wilderness. They're not allowed. So um, have some way to navigate on the snow in this area, because yes, you will be going one mile an hour or even slower if you're getting lost. Um, you know, figure out. You take one of my classes. I'll teach you how to navigate on snow. Uh, and another thing that, that might be of interest, I, I don't have a slide for it, but um, I think it's really important this year are, you know, GPS devices like, like Ned kind of alluded to. And what, what I go. personally use is, is this guy right here. It's, it's a, well, it used to be DeLorme, now it's Garmin. It's called an inReach device. It's a two-way messenger, which, which is very helpful. As a matter of fact, I just used this device last year to get a sick JMT hiker helicopter out of Kings Canyon. Um, so you can have a two-way communication with, you know, your people back home, but it also will give you GPS coordinates. Um, the, the trail crew helped us radio when the helicopter actually had to use it to, um, you know, yep. to get the exact GPS coordinates. So 
it, it, it's, it's expensive. I mean, I won't lie, you know, here's about $320 and there is a, a monthly subscription fee, which you can turn off and on, which I find very helpful because I don't, I don't use it, you know, when I'm not hiking. Um, but I think this year it's going to be worth its weight in gold, especially for, you know, GPS and also just having that two-way communication. Hey, let me add okay. something else in there. Um, the inReach, because of its two-way satellite connection, allows you to, if you have friends ahead of you, to uh, talk back and forth, or rather not talk, but text back and forth and talk about places where, you know, your buddy up front got lost and he can warn you in the back, you know, a couple of days back or whatever, you know, go right or go left when you see something. Um, that's really priceless. You know, uh, the guys in advance should be, you know, not just publishing to Facebook or whatever when they go out to Lone Pine, but if you've got anybody else that you're connected with, you know about that's coming up behind you, say a week back or something like that, um, tell them so that they can tell their friends a week behind you, you know, what the creek crossing was like, what the pass was like. That would be, that's priceless. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. I think very, very, very good for this year. So um, moving forward here, the next two slides are a pass strategy for doing one per day. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail here. I'm not going to go into every single point. And you can download these slides from the PCTWater.com website. But the main thing here is, you know, to have a general plan. And this is what this is what I used in 2014. And I've I've hiked the the section in Kings Canyon Sequoia, you know, JMT PCT multiple times. This is typically what I end up doing. The good news, at least from my perspective, is I, I think it's easier going going northbound than southbound. But with the snow this year, it's it's, it's going to be challenging either way. Some key points to remember, you're usually going to have more snow on the north side of the passes, although this year I think you're just going to have a ton on both sides. Um, I've listed some of the potential exit points here, you know, and, and this whole plan is set up with day zero camping at Tyndall Creek, which is just below Forester Pass. It's pretty high elevation. I think you're around 11,000 at that point, so it's going to be nippy that night. Um, and, the t and Tyndall Creek right there, which for me, I, I – it seemed like it was a semi-difficult crossing in 2014, but I also crossed it late in the day. And we'll talk about timing of creek crossings later on. But if you get across that and you mm -hmm. camp there at Tyndall Creek, you can, you can go across one pass per day. Um, for example, your first day would be Forester Pass. And, and we have a whole, we have photos on each of these first five passes coming up here so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Um, a lot of people will go over Forrester. Um, they probably won't be able to get all the way up to Kearsarge that same day, especially this year. But your next plan would probably be to go up over Kearsarge Pass down to Onion Valley Trailhead where you can hitch, hopefully, down to Independence. And that's a very popular spot to send a resupply box, take, take a zero day or two, you know, evaluate, hey, do I want to push forward or not? Um, once you go back up, you could, your next pass would be Glen Pass. Um, go over that, and we have more slides to show you, because Glen Pass is probably one of the more challenging passes from a steep, steepness perspective on the north side. But as you're going up the PCT from here, which is also the JMT at this point, there's Baxter Pass, Sawmill Pass, Caboose Pass. These are all to the east. Now, now you got to remember, you got to go up and over them and then go down quite a ways and I kind of detailed out, you know, hey, what's the elevation you're going to need to go up to? Then you're going to hike down, like, for example, Baxter Pass here. you got to go up to 12.3 from 10.2. Then you got a 7.2-mile hike down to the trailhead, which is at 6,000 feet. So look at that. That's 6,000 feet of elevation decrease. And who knows where the snow level is at this point. So it's not going to be a nice, easy trail. And then you got a road walk to Highway 395. Um, it, it's doable. It's just it's going to be challenging. So if you get up there, and let's say you get over Glen Pass, and you're like, oh, man, this isn't for me. You know, look, look on Half Mile's map. He's got these very well marked. I got the mile junctions here, and you could try to get over one of these potential exit points. Um, for myself, I've been over Kearsarge, and I've been over Taboose. I haven't been over Baxter or Sawmill, so I don't know what the conditions are like. Um, I tried to give you some idea of what the conditions are going to be like for, like, Baxter Pass here. It's an unmaintained trail. Um, now, it doesn't matter for a lot of parts because you'll be on snow, but eventually when you get down below the snow line, it's going to be unmaintained, so keep that in mind. But, hell, at that point, you're, you're going to be an expert in that stuff, so it probably won't matter. But the key here, and I, I alluded to this earlier, is that, you know, try to camp as high as possible. Um, you know, try to get as close as possible to that next pass, and that could mean camping on snow. Um, I, I know it's not preferred by me, but if you can minimize the time it takes for you to get up and over that pass the next day, it's going to save you a lot of heartache and misery. It'll save you from post holing for potential thunderstorms, and it'll also give you a good setup for the next pass because you got to get 
you got to go up and over, go down to a valley, then then start, you know, a little bit of an uphill to set yourself up for the next day. And so this next slide just kind of continues on. You know, we talked about Mather Pass and Mirror Pass, and we got more slides to talk about that. Um, the last potential exit point that I've listed here, although there's many others, is Bishop Pass. That's a very a common one. one. Yeah, it's a good one to go over. Um, it's 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 quite a haul because you're going up from eight seven to you know almost twelve thousand feet, and there's going to be a lot of snow. So that'll take you out to the South Lake Trailhead, which is a very popular spot. Um, usually the parking lot is 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 cramped full, and you can hitch a ride down to Bishop, which is probably the biggest town in in the Highway 395 um, Highway 395 yeah. corridor. A yeah, very popular resupply spot. Uh, Shots Bakery is, you know, great. Hikers love it, especially because you got hiker hunger at, at that time. Not to downplay, not to downplay the rest of the passes, but in the absence of time, we're just going to focus on the first five here. So, so jumping right into that, and I apologize if you're asking questions and we're not, we're not answering them. It's hard for me to go back and forth and see the questions. And in the essence of time, we'll, we'll you know, about nine, nine thirty our time, we'll start talking. We'll, we'll get to your Q and A because I really want to have a chance to do that. But the next, yeah, the next slide, I'll, yeah, yeah. If, if I don't want to get too sidetracked, so I want to get through these next slides. Um, so we're going to have photos here to show you what these passes actually look like now. Just keep in mind, all these photos are from a very low snow year, so you're going to see a lot more, a lot more snow when you're up there. But this is Forester Pass, looking from the south side, and you know, if you've never been up there before, it's a little mind-boggling because you basically come up into this this high, you know, somewhat level basin, and you're wondering where the hell is the pass? Well, it's this <laughs> notch right here. Um, you can, and you can even kind of see the, the switchbacks going up and eventually cuts across. And, and I have a, a photo that shows you the ice shoot, which is right where I'm circling right here. So as you're coming up the pass, this is looking south. I um, you're not at the top yet. This is the basin that you're walking up. Mm -hmm. it, it's probably going to be all snow when you're there. And you'll mm -hmm. see all these footpaths. And that's where your, your GPS device comes into play, um, your, your half mile app, your gut hook app. You know, half mile will tell you how far are you off the trail. Now, you don't have to be on the trail, obviously, because you know you're. It's going to be probably under 10 feet of snow at that point. Um, but uh, Gut Hooks app will actually give you a, a graphical representation of where you are in relation to the actual trail. And that could be helpful, you know, just from a, a general perspective. But you're, as you're coming up this pass, you know, you're getting pretty high up, and then you get to the ice shoot uh, or snowshoe, whatever you want to call it. Um, I have no idea what it's going to look like this year. There's, I imagine a, a ton more snow, but you can kind of see, you know, there's usually a footpath that's been blocked through there. I think, Ned, you actually go up there and create some of these footpaths, don't you? Yeah. Wow. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, so a very valuable service that, that he offers to, to all the hikers there. Um, this is probably the most daunting section, but um, you know, usually it's not too bad. It looks worse than it is. Just just go so, go slow and be careful. Now we get to the top of the pass. This is what it looks like from the north side. So you can see all this snow. Well, you probably won't see any of this rock when you're up there, which could be good for you because it might give you more opportunities to glissade down and, and get more elevation decrease in a fast amount of time. For, for 2014, by the time we got up there on these passes and with the amount of snow, it was too slushy to glissade and yep. there was too much rock, rock poking through. <laughs> so, you know, if we tried to glissade, we probably would have had a pretty bad day. So there are some silver linings for, for your year here. Uh, but, the, but the snow field on the north side of Forester Pass is, is pretty, pretty extensive. Um, I think we went down all the way down to this area. It was like a good, you know, four or five miles before we finally got out of the snow. So get up to this path as early as possible because you have a lot of work ahead of you just to get down to where you're going to camp the next day. Mm-hmm. And just to show you a shot, you know, this is what it looks like from the southbound side. So if you're, if you're southbound or you haven't been up there, it can be a little confusing. I remember the first time I went up there when there was no snow, and I'm like, where the hell is this pass? It's this notch right in here. Can I step in? Go for Briefly. it. <clears throat> yeah. The premise behind what Matt's saying, the logistics of doing a pass a day, is from the point of view of, oh, my God, I don't want to push to another step. So what you do is just, rather than snowshoes, and I, I saw the question earlier and answered that one, I've carried snowshoes plenty of times in the Sierra and rarely used them. Um, if I thought that there was any merit in trying to use snowshoes in the afternoon, you know, when, it, when it's postal in conditions, um, you know, yeah, maybe you can do another mile, but you're already freaking exhausted. Uh, you've been up since four. So... Um, 
call it quits. When, when, when it gets post holing uh, stupid out there and the snow is like mashed potatoes, just like if you can't see some sort of rock line or a dry area that you can walk along and, and get out of the snow for just you know 10 or 20 steps or something like that, give yourself a break, I'd almost call it quits for the day. It's just not worth it. So it depends upon how low the snow line is. So on, the, on Matt's pictures, uh, if you, if you're, how do I say this? Uh, the, well, let me just keep it simple. Get up early. Utilize any cold snow, cold hard snow uh, you can that's supporting your weight. You know, five in the morning, maybe an hour or so before the sun comes up. Get out there onto that and start making your miles one mile an hour again, guys. But once you're post and you're not going anywhere. You're floundering. You're you're sinking in like to your groin. The only way to get out of that is to take the pack off and roll out sideways onto the snow. And, of course, you're laughing. It's really silly looking and all that. But it, all this stuff takes time. So get up really early. Utilize any hard snow you've got. Hopefully get over the pass before the snow starts to soften a little on the top. You want it hard enough so you're not post tolling going up, but you sure as hell don't want to be post tolling going down because what happens there is that when your leg suddenly pops through the surface and, and goes into you know knee height or whatever, where is, what does your upper body do? You've got downhill momentum going on. So your upper body is going to fold at the hip. You're going to start to fall sideways onto your shoulder. Your leg is stuck in the snow. So it's going to torque your hip, it's going to torque your knee, you're going to get hurt. Even if you don't scratch up against boulders as you slid into that post hole, um, downhill post holing is really bad. So get up and over the passes early, early, say by 9 or 10 at the latest, and get down the backside before you start post holing on the descent. Glissade wherever you can. If it's soup already, you know, you sit down to glissade with your feet below you and you're in the self-arrest position, you're ready to, you know, control your speed and all that. Uh, and you just, just what we used to call sit smart. You just simply sit down and, you know, you're sitting so deep in the soft snow, you can't even slide on a slope. It's ridiculous. So that's way too late. Get over the, the top early and get down to dry trail before it turns to slush. Because it's like yeah. Matt was showing this last slide going down the north side of Forrester, which we do every week uh, once May hits. Um, you get about halfway down that descent, are you going to go back to it? Show that picture, Matt, um, looking north from the top of Forrester, if you can. Um, you get about halfway down, and the thing, you, you get down to Center Basin Junction, you, down there in the trees, sort of just left of center, way in the distance. That Center Basin Junction, that tree line, just a little bit further to the left, Matt, where the trees are in the background. There, you, right there, right in there. So that's Center Basin Junction. You got the Center Basin going off to the right. That's where Tree Line is. That's where your first big creek crossing is going to be, uh, at least on the north side of Forrester. It's not a big deal, but you're going to have to find a log or something. Um, if it's slushy down there, if you've still got another 1,000 or 1,500 feet or more of snow to, to, to walk, uh, in elevation that is, uh, you're in the trees now, so it's just going to be murderous. I've been in that area too many times when it got really slushy. So Get done with your day by post only time. I don't care when it is. If you still have more snow to go, just stop. No sense in killing yourself. If you can, as Matt said, you're down below snow line, you cross the creek, you're going back up the other side, everything, you're swinging your feet, you're happy, your feet are starting to dry out. Um, then you hit snow line again. As much as you can, get up as high as you can because you don't want too many miles to uh, be on your, um, your, your agenda for, for the next morning that you can't make it over the pass by 10. So some of your, uh, some of your distances between passes, and, and I'm thinking of one in particular, which is between Glen and, and Pinchot, there's a bit of a distance there. You know, you think, okay, yeah, in the summer you can do two passes in one day, but here you may just make it down to, to Woods Creek Crossing and the Swinging Bridge down there and call it good. You're happy to see dry ground. Oh. Yeah, but, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that pass next. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just saying yeah, it may let, not be a pass yeah, a day, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just the general mindset to kind of put yourself in it and to kind of, you know, elaborate more on Ned's point on post holing. I took this photo right before I post holed and then there's my foot. Um, as you can see here, these are hikers that were, that were behind me. You know, we're off, obviously off trail at this point. You're kind of coming down the slope. Look at all, look at all these rocks right here. This was the rock, rock slash snow field I was trying to navigate because I, there was no other way to go. And it was already pretty slushy. I didn't, now I didn't hit a rock this big, probably one like that side or that size. But you hit a rock post holing, it's gonna it's it's gonna hurt you. 
So talking a little bit about the next pass, Glen Pass, um, it, it can be quite challenging on the north side. Just some, some south side photos here to give you an idea of what it's like going up. Um, I, just keep in mind, this is a low snow year, so you're going to see more than what's in the photos. But as you're getting up to it, um, you can kind of see the PCT here. You may not be able to see any, any trail, probably footprints, but you'll see up here there's this big bow, you know, saddle in the middle. That's Glen Pass when you get to the top. And as you're at the top, this is looking south. You just came up this ridge right here. You can kind of see, you know, some, some, some footprints there. But looking north is really where it gets challenging. And so we're on top of the pass now. You can see all these you know, footprint paths going out. Basically what we did, um, we went out and then you go right down this steep slope. And, you know, with you guys, with as much snow that's going to be up there, hopefully you can do some glissading, which will help. We couldn't do that in 2014. This is a, an angle that you're looking at going down. This is as I was going down the pass, so you can kind of see there's a footprint path here. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty daunting, but if you just take your time, you know, try not to postal and don't try not to hit it when it's too icy too, because that can be challenging. You can kind of see this is what it looks like on the north side looking south. So now here's, there's a top of Glen Pass that you were just, you just were up. And here's all these footprint paths coming down. So, Ned, I think in the last webinar you were talking about potentially glissading. Can you comment on where good areas might be on here? Because I, I remember you had some good comments on that. Yeah, if you can use your, your arrow to show, there's a right below the arrow that marks Glen Pass. So go to your right a little bit, Matt, right there. That area, that flow, very, very steep. Um, you, you're going to be definitely on the edges of your shoes. You're going to be going, like, holy crap, if I fall here, I'm a dead guy. Because what happens is right below Matt's arrow, that's a convex slope. You can't see the rocks below you. It's just this white curve will go out and disappear into the air. And if you think, okay, I'm just going to go straight from here. Hey, I'm on the path. I'm just going to go straight down. You're going to end up in the rocks and the cliffs further below Matt's arrow. So continue, follow the, 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 the summer trail. So the summer trail is going to traverse straight across that slope where Matt's arrow is. And then in that chute, in that kind of like right below Matt's arrow, go down through there. You can, it's not convex. It's actually concave. And you can see rocks approaching, and you can hit your brakes by digging in your heels or self-arresting or whatever before you get to them um, as you're sitting on your butt sliding down. Um, that would be the better way to go. Utilize, because you guys are up there on snow and you're making early morning starts, utilize these, these opportunities to sit down and have a roller coaster ride that's just like the run of your life. It's a gas, especially Forrester. You can drop several thousand feet in, in, in minutes. And, and have a blast. So right where the arrow is, come down that way. Uh, you don't need to follow the trail. Switch back over on the left of the arrow and come on down the bottom, sliding on your butt, laughing the whole way. And when you get out of the bottom, stand up and walk out onto the rocks and reevaluate where Ray Lakes are. You, can, you saw Ray Lakes from the top. That's your objective. You'll be able to con, you know, see the bowl it sits in. So even if you get down to the bottom here and you go like, okay, crap, which way now? As you can see in this picture, that lake uh, and so forth, that lake's a little bit to the left of where you want to be, but there's Ray Lakes right there. That's where you're going. So when you get down to the bottom of this, just go straight, kind of a little bit to the right, um, you know, heading toward 1 or 2 o'clock, and as you go over a rise, there's a rise down there that you can't see the lakes when you get to the bottom, but once you get to the top of the rise, you'll see Ray Lakes and you can keep going. So that's kind of how you navigate above Timberline in the Sierras. It's all line of sight. It's what you see. So you just identify something in the distance and you aim for it and go for it and then reevaluate. Yeah, yeah and, and that just really highlights the importance of the topo maps. And I got a slide that yeah. really shows that Premier Pass coming up. Uh, so the next pass, Pincho Pass, unfortunately, I, I didn't have any good photos of the approach um, coming from the south side. So this is almost near the top or pretty much at the top looking south. Pretty much, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the PCT kind of goes, you can't see it. It's behind this ridge. It comes up this valley loops around here, comes around these lakes, then goes right up this, this ridge line. And when you, when you get to this point, it can, it can be kind of tough to figure out where, where the hell is the pass, because all this will probably be all snow when you get there. And there's two so saddles, for, actually. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. one like over here that I, yep, I first couple of times there. I was up there, I thought, oh, that's it. No, it's, it's the one that will be to your, to your right. Um, so it's not easy to see, and this is where all your topo maps and your you know, half-mile Gothic app and your inReach all come into play. So you kind of come up this, this ridge line here, and as you get closer to the top, this is what it looked like in 2014. 
Um, this this was it, it's actually steeper <laughs> if I remember correctly. I was a little nervous at this spot, um, but as you get close to the top here, you can you know you can see here there's all these wall. footsteps in here. Yeah, head wall, but um you know it's going to look a lot different this year. And then as you get to the top, this is what it looks like looking north, but this is all going to be snow. Um, and it's it, it kind of looks like it's really not that steep, but the the first couple hundred feet it actually is steep. You just can't see here that the trail switchbacks and it goes down this valley and that's a Marjorie Lake right there. It goes all the way down into mm -hmm. this deep valley here, which is that's one cool. of the more difficult yeah, which is one of the more difficult creek crossings. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But then um, your fourth pass. Mather Pass here, it's, it's actually the easiest one to spot. You can see it from, you know, almost four or five miles away. Um, it's just this saddle right here. Um, kind of similar to Forest in that you, you hike up onto what we call an upper basin. It's, it's very wide open, very flat, well, somewhat flat, um, with this constant grade going up. This will all be snow covered, this, this whole area here. And as you're approaching it, you can, well, this, you can even see the switchbacks of the PCT coming up to it, um, but you won't see that this year. And um, what the trail actually comes around, it goes all the way out here. You kind of see it. Then it starts this long traverse over and switchbacks over and goes there. But, Ned, you mentioned you in the last webinar that it might be easier, I think, to go up around this area and then cut across. So can you, can you yeah, highlight let's, that? Let's talk about, yeah, let me talk about these two. Um, as you saw with Pincho, you identify that leading ridge, the, the ramp that goes up to the pass. Uh, when, on Pincho, you've got the two passes. So the one that has the ramp, the little ridge going up to it, that's the, the one you want to go to. Now on Mather, uh, as Matt said, it's once again, it's a big upper basin above Timberline. You're highly exposed. Um, the advantage of being on snow where there's no dirt visible is you're not suckered into, okay, there's a trail. I've got to go over there. And then I'll be happy I'm on trail. Oh, no, then it just disappears. And, okay, like, where the hell am I? Um, there's no trail. So you can go. It's really freeing. There's a freedom of looking. At, you know, you look at this slide and just think of it all white. So it's all white. Where were you going to go? You're going to go straight for the pass. So in this case, you're going to get past this little tarn, this little lakey thing here right below the arrow. That's all going to be white anyway. People go, can I walk on a lake? Yeah, you can as long as you don't see any blue, like a little bit of blue right there. And it's not cracking out around the edges. So if you get there and it's starting to crack out, you see some open water, don't walk on it, go around it, and you see that black ramp. What the Summer Trail does, under the words Mather Pass in white, that little white box, the Summer Trail goes way to the right of that, on that back wall, and then switch back left and goes way back over here into the bowl, and you're going like, why the heck do I want to go all the way to the right just to go to the left? Well. Hey, guys, you're on snow. You don't see the trail. It doesn't make a bit of difference. So what you want to do is get on this black ramp. It's actually a little ridge line. Work your way up that thing to the top of the black. It's a little bit of a level spot right there where the arrow is. At that point, you're going to be suckered into wanting to go up into the rocks slightly where, where you know, typically that area doesn't hold snow. And you're thinking, okay, I can be on dry rock, and I can cut to the right and go straight over to the pass, and I'm golden. Unfortunately, the rock is very loose up there, and people have problems and fall down and, and get into trouble. So it's safer to, at the point of that arrow, instead of going up into the rocks, go straight over into the bowl and cut switchbacks in the snow all the way up. Better yet, if you get there and you get past this lake and you're looking at that black ramp and you're going like, you know what, that uh, black rock, it's exposed, it's standing out now. I don't know if I really want to get up there. I heard that it's loose rock. Hey, you don't have to. Go into the bowl just to the left of the words Mather Pass, that white square. Get into that bowl right there and make your own switchbacks. Just, you know, kick steps, uh, you know, going all the way up and maintain your balance. Don't fall down and you'll be perfectly fine and work your way all the way up. Now, typically Mather and uh, Mather, Pinchot, and Forrester have head walls. Um, depending upon when you get there, there may be a bit of a steep section at the very top. You're simply going to tow in and go straight up it. That's the safest way up. Um, Matt may have a picture I don't remember, but uh, like you saw in Matt's picture of Pincho, there's you know if there's a lot of people up ahead of you, you're in the herd. There will be a trough or a what we call a boot track in the snow for you to follow, and that may oftentimes be the safest route because it's flattest. And if you just have micro spikes, all the better. Stay in the boot track and uh, and go that way. 
Yeah, so here's a photo of the upper basin area that we're talking about. It actually extends all the way back here. You were just in this area with Pinchot, came down this valley, dipped down uh, one of the forks of the Kings River. I can remember which one it is, but it's a challenging cross. South Fork. South Fork. And then you come up this basin, so this will all be snow. And that, I think that's the tarn that Ned was yeah. referring to. And this is the, the black ramp over here. But once you get to the top, you're, re you're rewarded with a, an amazing view of the Palisade. Yeah. Um, hey, two very important points. Can I? Can you go back to that slide, that last one? Sorry to interrupt you, Matt, but two real important points. Um, this, this slide or, or another no, slide? No, the one right before, that one. That's what the Sierras is going to look like in August. For all of you JMT people, there's so much snow, you're still going to have these kind of conditions in August. Uh, okay, and the second point is, if Matt goes to – well, that, that slide I'll do. Down below, yeah, the, in the far distance, where, the, where you're down in the trees between Pinchot and where you're standing, you're going to look at this crossing of the South Fork, and it's a, that's a nasty crossing. It's wide, it's fast, and it has a lot of water volume down in there. Do you have to cross it? No, you don't. Just because the stupid summer, tra summer trail goes that way, you don't have to. So how do you avoid it? Simply stay to the right, uh, go up like toward Taboose Pass, and stay. Yeah, well, that, up, that, would be, that, would, that would be to the left in this photo. <laughs> Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm sorry. So to boot, yeah, to boost yeah. passes right over here. Yeah. Right. So simply stay on the side of the creek that you're on, or a river in this case, and just follow it in the general direction of Mather. You don't have to cross the thing until you get up high enough in what we call the upper basin up here. And if you want to cross it, fine. But do you have to? Hell no. Stay on the right side, or in this picture, stay on the left side of this of the drainage and work your way all the way up Mather and it's not way, that way you avoid the deadly crossing. Good point. So once you get on top of Mather, um, the trail it switch backs down this way and goes through this basin and goes just here to the east of the Palisade Lake, but you won't see any of the trail. Um, and it can be, it can be, you know, a little steep here, not as steep as some of the other ones, but, um, you know, keep that in mind. You have a pretty Pretty's big snow safe. field to get down. Yeah, yeah, you should have enough snow to glissade, so that should help you. But it's kind of like Forrester. You're going to have, a, you know, a lot of snow to get past on the other side, too, you know, so your work is not done yeah. once you get to the top. This is uh, looking, this is on the north side looking south, so this is what it will look like for Sobos as you're coming down, and you can see some hikers here. Um, but the, the last one we're going to talk in depth about is Muir Pass, and um, this one's special because it always holds a lot of snow. I mean, this was even in 2014. You know, that was a low snow year. Um, it, and it could be pretty confusing. Um, it, you, you go on for many, many miles on snow. I did about seven miles in 2014. I think this year it's going to be a lot more. Um, it's on both sides of the pass, so give yourself a lot of time to get over this guy and camp as high as possible as you can the day before. You're going to see tons of different footprint paths, which is confusing, and this is where your topo maps, your half-mile goat hook app, um, the HikerBot app, and also your inReach are all going to come into play here. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, always carry those hard copy maps because if you don't have them and your phone dies, you could be in trouble. As you're going up, it's a beautiful pass. Um, Helen Lake here, you're just going to be mesmerized by the scenery. It's one of my favorite spots in this area. But um, when you get it, – it, it's just really confusing. If you, and if you look at Half Mile's map here as you're coming up, as a matter of fact, I'll just pull it up because I think it's a lot easier to, to talk to it. It's in California Section H. If you go down to slide, let's see, it's right. He's going. There you go. Yeah, this this one right here. So on on page twelve, yep. You can kind of see, uh, you know, you, you just you just came over Mather. Well, not just. It's actually pretty far back. But you you start coming yeah. up this Lacan Canyon, up a Lacan Canyon, and there's all these zigzags. And here's Muir Pass right here. Now. If there's trail, it's no problem. You can follow your way up there. But if there's no trail, it's confusing. <laughs> and, and and even I, I got lost um, going up there. Can in I simplify that? If you go back to that sure. map, yeah, you you can get lost if you're trying to follow the trail. But if you uh, – where's the map, the, the bigger version of that topo? You were just on it, the half-mile map? I'm on it right now. There it is. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. From Big Pete Meadow. You probably, yeah, it depends upon what the elevation of the area is, but it looks like it's like nine or something. I don't know, Big Pete. But once you get up into the Little Lakes up higher, which is the area of Stars Camp right there, you probably hit snow line. How do you get lost in there if you're following this creek? Helen Lake drains all the way down. So simply follow the creek. 
you don't necessarily need to follow the trail. Just be close to the creek, not too close so you don't fall in or slip in or whatever, but just parallel the creek all the way up. You'll crest it onto Helen Lake. You'll go, oh my gosh, okay, here's the outflow of Helen Lake. So stay to the, the left of the lake, traverse across it. Then you're going to figure out, okay, well, where the heck is the path? You're looking straight toward Mount Solomon's. Now, yeah, I think Matt's got that other. There you go. You're looking right down the green line at Mount Solomon's. Where's the pass? It's a little bit to the right. So walk from Helen Lake toward Mount Solomon's, and as you start to get into this bowl, start looking up for a saddle on your right, and that's near pass. Yeah, so, and we're just trying to highlight here the importance of topo maps, and, and you got to know how to read them. And so uh, not, not really much else to say. Ned are pretty much already elaborated on it, but you can just see the green lines here. So you're, you're, sitting, you're standing at point A. Here's Muir Pass on your map, point B. You can see Mount Solomon. You can see Helen Lake. So you can, you're looking for landmarks on the topo map. And from yeah. that, you can, get a, you can get a general idea where the pass is. You can't see it from the south side. I mean, you don't see it, so you're almost right upon it. But you know, look for Helen Lake, look for Mount Solomon's, and you'll be fine. Of course, you get to the top, you have the infamous Muir, Muir Hut, which can be used as an emergency shelter, but don't plan on you know, camping there unless you really have to. It's not very big, too. Then looking on the north side, <laughs> it's kind of demotivating. It's beautiful, but you realize, holy crap, I got all this snow to still traverse, and this is just one section of it. The trail goes down in between these lakes. That's Wanda Lake. It goes off to the right here, and there's even more snow as you go down further. And as you're going down further, if you're a Sobo, you can look back up. The pass is actually really easy to spot from the stuff on the um, the north side, and it's not steep, so that there is a silver yeah. lining there. Um, but you're just going to be on tons of snow, so I'm still hiking. You know, I'm still hiking. Oh God, this you know this is after you make that bend around Wanda Lake, which is up here above this ridge, still on snow, and this is a low snow year. So just give yourself a lot of time. You're going to be on a lot of snow on your pass. So a little bit about water crossings. Um, I just highlighted the five that I think are going to be really challenging this year, um, but I think there's going to be more just because of the level of snow up there. You know, and the key point to remember here is, and, and this is so hard for me to fathom until I actually saw it in person, it can be a difference of a few feet, if not more, in the water level if you hit the creek in the morning as opposed to late in the afternoon. And the reason I say that is I, I stayed in, this was years ago, I was in Backpackers Campground in the Yosemite Valley, and I got there around, I don't know, noon. And you, and you have to cross a little creek for you guys that have been there, you know what I'm talking about. And it was maybe up to like, you know, you know, halfway up to my knee. By the time my friends got there at 10 o'clock at night, it was all the way up to my mid-thigh. Yeah, luckily, luckily it wasn't running that fast, but that, that, just, that just showed me, oh, oh wow, you know, wow. How, much, how much difference it can, it can be later in the day. I'm sorry, was there a question? No question? Okay. Um, so these are, these are the five that I would really try to hit early in the day if possible. Um, Ned already talked about the South Fork, the Kings River. This is between Pencho and Mather. Evolution Creek can be a challenging one, but what's important to note is there is an alternate. It's about a mile before the, the official trail crossing. It, the, the creek is a lot wider. It's not as deep, and it's just an easier place to cross. I highly recommend it this year. Bear Creek is probably <laughs> the bear of them all, no pun yeah. intended, at mile 869. It's, it's always the most challenging one. Um, I don't know what it's going to be like depending on you know, when you guys get up there this year, but I would definitely plan on crossing that one early in the day as opposed to later in the day. And then there's Carrot a Creek. Crossing we, of that. I think oh, there's there a log crossing okay. of Bear Creek. Yeah. When you guys get to creeks, drop your packs and go up and down the creek. Look for something that's safer uh, you know, alternate route across it. And I do believe Bear Creek has a log crossing. Uh, I don't remember if it's upstream or downstream. It came up in the last webinar, but they're explore okay. Yeah. And give yourself more time. You know, everyone does it differently for myself. You know, when I finally get into my tent at the end of the night and I've had my dinner and I'm about to go to sleep, I, I, I take out my maps and I plan out the next mm -hmm. two days, not just the first day, the first, the next two days, because you're going to have to be factoring in passes and creek crossings here which don't always um, meld up in terms of the optimal times. It's so, uh, kind of contradictory, Matt. Uh, the, what we've said already about pass logistics, if you throw in creek logistics into the equation, because obviously you've yeah, got creeks and passes you've got to deal with, <laughs> it's ideal to go across the creek in the morning. 
So where are you? You're down way low on the trail, you know, at the creek crossing. You still have the entire five, six, seven miles, whatever it is, to get up to the pass. But based on what we've already told you, camp high, that means you're crossing mid-afternoon, say, uh, of the creek to be able to camp high. That means you're going to deal with the creek when it's when it's higher uh, volume pushing on you as you wade across the thing. So it, it's going to sound contradictory. We're just simply laying out when is it the best time to cross the creek when the flow is obviously lower. When yeah. that, that's in the morning. That's the best time, but it may not be logistically the best time for you. Ideally, avoid it, yeah. like we talked about with the South Fork of the Kings. You can avoid that thing by staying to the right and going up uh, into the upper basin and toward Mather, but you can't avoid, I mean, like, like evolution. Evolution, you're going to get to the creek crossing, you know, look at that thing, and it's a deeper channel, it's faster moving, and that's the sort of thing where you're going to have a lot of boulders, there's a lot of erosion in the channel, so it's not going to be a simple thing to get across. Whereas if you go upstream, like Matt was saying, a mile or half a mile or whatever it is, it's, it's well marked, um, you're in a meadow. So any kind of creek crossing uh, that might be safer is going to be on the map in an area where you see the little blue line of the creek doing these, this serpentine kind of thing because it's really flat. The, the creek doesn't know where to go, so it's going to wind around a lot. That means it's going to be slow moving. It's going to be very wide. Because it's slow moving, there won't be big erosion boulders in the, in the bottom of the creek for you to have to balance your way through and, and, and pick a route. It's much easier to cross any, any creek if you can identify where it's flat, where it's wide, where it's not going to be moving so fast, where it's going to be easier, a nice bottom. If it's also white water and turbulent and steep and narrow and nasty, you can't see the bottom because it's all foamy white water. And there's a tremendous amount of push of that water against your, your legs and thighs as you're working your way across. So if there's a meadow nearby, screw the trail. Go up to the meadow, cross there. Yeah, so if you're looking at your topo maps and you see, you know, a thick blue line or even a medium thick blue line, tell yourself this is going to take me some time to get over because you may not be able to cross right where you think you're going to. You may have to go up or down the creek a mile or, you know, half mile, quarter mile, whatever, to find that optimal place to cross. And, and for the guys, and for the water report where we're adding the Ford updates, it's really important when you guys send an update to tell me what time of day you hit that crossing. Because that, that'll give you know the hikers behind you a good indication of what it's like in the morning or the afternoon, depending on when you hit it. So, um, if for anyone who wants to see some videos of these crossings, I, I made a video of my of California Section H. You can click on this link and go there. Um, there is a, a section where I had a video of people crossing Bear Creek. Although, you know, keep in mind that was a low snow year, so it's going to be a lot higher this year. So we want to talk a little bit about flipping strategies um, because a lot of people, you know, every year they, they think, okay, I'll just, I'll get to the high Sierra, maybe there's too much snow, I'll, I'll flip to Northern Cal or Oregon or Washington, and I'll come back and do the Sierra, um, which is usually a valid approach. However, this year is, is unique in many regards, and I mentioned earlier that the whole West Coast of the United States got a, a ton of snow this year. So even though you may flip from, say, Kennedy Meadows South to, like, you know, Sierra City is a popular one to flip to here at, at a mile 1195, you're probably going to have snow, so you're flipping to just more snow. Um, what I've done here is I just give it in trees, yeah. Um, I've given you just this is all just data taken straight from half miles map and in one concise format and two slides, where you can see here's where a lot of the you know a lot of highways cross the PCT, a lot of places where people you know hitch to. A lot of times you're you're hitching from here to go down to like say Chester or or you know to get a resupply box or whatever. I put the elevation of where it crosses the trail, the mile in the section. But what's important to, to note here is that this is the lowest point on the trail at that time, uh, especially in Northern California. If you flip to say Sierra City, okay, well, you're gonna, cr you're gonna get to the PC at, at 4,600 feet, but you're going up. From all these elevation points, you're going right back up. So if the, if the snow line is say 5,000 feet at Sierra City, well, it's not gonna take too long. You're gonna run into snow anyways. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about potentially flipping, and maybe you can call ahead. You know, some of these places have businesses right right there on the highway. Call your trail angel at home. Say, hey, can you find out what the snow levels are around these points? It's going to be a little bit more challenging this year. And then mm -hmm. the, the next slide here is just on the places where it crosses in Washington too. Um, one one note of interest: there, there is a, a shuttle service that goes up and down the Highway 395 corridor in the Sierra. So the Sierras would be over here on the left. It's called Eastern Sierra Transit Authority. I've actually used it. I had to bail on, on, a, on a hike years ago. 
in the Mammoth area, and I was able to use it to get up to Reno to rent a car to get back to where I live in, in Santa Cruz in the Bay Area. So as you're trying to go up and down the Highway 395 corridor for flipping or for whatever reason, this is a really good source of information to, to, get, to get that done. Hey, Matt, somewhere along the line, we got to, before we sign off, and I think you're aiming for somewhere around 10, uh, we got to talk to the Southbounders too. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let, let's. I'm, I'm almost done here. I want to get to Q and A that we we could start that discussion off with South Founders because that is important. Um, yeah. I'm not going to talk too much about resupply because you guys are probably blue in the face hearing about resupply points. Just remember, the high level overview is that the roads going up to the points where your resupply box box should be are going to be snowed in a lot later this year, so they're going to open later. Um, one thing that I that I found very helpful in 2014 is Yogi has these laminated resupply cards that you can buy. They're pretty cheap, only 15 bucks. They fit in your pack. You know, there's like six six sheets. It's really good to have these because you're going to be calling Audible when you're on the trail. You might have to call your trail and go home and say, oh hey, don't ship it here. Ship it to this point instead. And, and it has all of the address information. You know, the, the times that they're open. If it's a business, the post office. I think they're they're worth their weight in gold. Um, so I'm not going to go into the rest of the stuff. You, you can download the presentation here. I'd like to leave the rest of this open so we can answer all the questions that have come in because I know there's been a lot we haven't had a chance to get into. Um, but before we do that, Ned, do you want to talk a little bit about South Boundaries in Washington? Yeah, if I can. Um, after a normal winter, the typical re uh, starting date is about July 4th. Uh, somewhere along the line, people got into the idea, obviously l lulled to sleep by the drought winters, that June 15th was the ideal starting time. That would be fine if we had a dry uh, winter, which, of course, we haven't. We haven't even had a normal winter. So after a heavy winter, it really is, guys, to tell you, it's more like August 1st. So the next question comes up, um, can I get through the Sierras if I start, you know, uh, August 1st before the Sierras gets its early season snowstorms? So you want to get through the Sierras by around Halloween. Um, typically, we don't get significant snow, meaning um, from about mid-September to mid-November, uh, we get dustings of snow, and we'll get maybe a foot or something like that, but it'll clear out and it'll melt off in a day or two. Not much of a problem. So hiking up in the Sierra late season just means you have, you know, sub-freezing nights. Your water in your canteens will freeze. You probably are not sleeping on snow. But, you know, bring a colder bag, a better tent, a tent that can take a little snow piling up on top without it flattening, that kind of deal. Um, the other question that comes up is what is it really like uh, up on the Canadian border? There's a very first steps I take, what am I going to be on? You're probably going to be on plenty of snow, um, large snow fields, but it's consolidated again. So, hey, I can walk on top as long as it freezes at night, as long as it's plenty cold. Uh, the problem, though, is that the North Cascades, um, it's very, very steep, as I mentioned before. At least I think I did. So anything you do up there at the very beginning of your trip, you've got to be very careful. You're on very steep. Uh, ridges dropping in and out of creeks, but you're in trees. Any kind of fall means you hit a tree. Uh, so just have that, you know, in the back of your mind. Go somewhere, uh, practice some stuff, you know, your ascent, descent techniques, uh, heel plunge, glissading, all that before you really shove off from Hart's Pass and go, you know, your uh, three days, uh, 10 miles a day up to Monument 78 and turn around and come back. So be savvy. It's it's, you're going to have plenty of snow. Okay, so for the remainder of the webinar, I just want to try to address all the questions that came in. Um, Willie, you're, I'm still not quite sure what you're asking about here, Willie. Wondering about layering for this section. Um, I don't know if you're still online, Willie. I do see you, but maybe yeah. you can um, audio-wise just, just tell us. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more on what you're looking for there? I need to turn his mic up. Yeah, you might your mic might be on mute, Willie. Well, I, I tell you what, if uh, if you figure it out, just uh, chime in or, or or type in more there. I'm well, not quite sure what you're asking, or maybe maybe you maybe, do, Ned. Well, maybe I mean I get this question a lot, so maybe I can field it as best I can. Um, layering mm -hmm. for the Sierras, I'm assuming that's the section he's talking about in the spring on snow. How do you anticipate that kind of, you know, how do I stay warm? If it's if you're there before the thaw when things are cold, obviously, man, you're going to be dressing for for winter conditions. 
It, it's really cold at night. It may get up into the 40s during the day, and you think, well, man, the sun's out. How come it isn't warmer? It's because ambient-wise, the temperatures are really cold. If you look at some of my pictures on uh, Mountain Education's Facebook page, you'll see pictures of people, you know, gloves, full shells, maybe even a, a face mask or something, and this is May. However, if you're in the Sierras after the thaw starts, it's 60 degrees, the sun is blinding, you're dealing more with sunburn than, than cold. How do you, you deal with this as clothing-wise? Layer, because the nights can still be, be uh, really cold. So you, you don't really want to be hiking in shorts and a t-shirt. You certainly can, but you're just going to get roasted alive. I mean, you've got not only the direct sun, but it's bouncing off the snow. You're just going to cook. Lots of sunscreen, zinc on your nose, whatever it takes, depends upon how sensitive you are. Um, but have layers, so, you know, uh, so that's how you deal with that. Yeah, that's a good point because on, on Muir Pass, I remember you're on snow for so long and the heat and the radiation bouncing off the of snow up into your yeah. face is intense. Um, I, I, I cover everything in my body because I'm really pale <laughs> and I had a sun hat on, you know, or just a hiking hat. And I was looking for those rock outcroppings not only to get off the snow, but just to get away from the, the heat that was being generated from the snow hitting me, you know, back in the face. It's, it's, it's incredible how hot it can get. Um, so I think you kind of addressed Jared's question here. Um, I'll go ahead and delete that. What did say? Uh, oh, he was just asking about special clothing considerations for the Sierra. Um, you you kind of hit on the tip of the iceberg there. Um, you okay. know, I, I think the the key point there is, you know, you're going to have to have some layering at night because it's going to be colder. But, you know, the time you guys get there, it's not like the nights are terribly cold and the fall should have happened already by then. Um, right. But I, I, you know, I, I packed, I think I had one extra layer of thermals, you know, just, just, just in case it got cold and I never had to use. Um, Flower Man asked, if the lake contours are not distinguishable, is there something to look for crossing the lake covered with snow? You want to yeah. cover that one, Ned? Yeah, well, we kind of talked about it a little bit. To, to establish whether you can walk across a lake, because you know, it's like, why walk around the thing if I can walk straight across? And during the winter, we walk straight across all of them, and you never know the difference between a lake and a meadow. As long as you're seeing white snow, rather than light blue or any kind of blue kind of showing through, which is implying that the snow is softening, um, not so much that there's, there's a water immediately below, because what we, we don't get like East Coast, ice on our lake yeah we do but what happens is is that the 20 feet of snow piles up on top of the lake on top of the ice pushes it down it breaks and then water fills and starts to you know uh, saturate up into the snowpack from the lake and then that freezes so in effect what you get is like four or five feet of frozen snow that's just one big iceberg um, essentially so once you start to see a little bit of blue uh, yeah you can walk on it sure i mean i've, I've pulled a, a 150 pound seven foot sled across lakes where it was ponding on top so there's puddles of water on top of the uh the, the five feet of ice frozen snow and it still looks just fine but the other thing you want to look for so i would basically for you guys i would discourage you from going across any lake where you can see any kind of bluish uh, a tint of a blue in the white snow um, and if there's any kind of peripheral cracking because that's where it's going to contract from as the thing starts to warm up you're going to get these big cracks going around the outside and then then they crack across and you get iceberg formations and stuff like that as time goes by. So if you see the, per the perimeter cracks or you see any kind of light blue, forget it, go around the lake. Okay, Flower Man asked, do you expect flooding in the Mojave because of the snow melt? Um, I see Ned, you said, don't know, and I don't know either. Although I think the silver lining on this one is last year, our previous five years, we, we've been in drought. And they were not turning on. There's a faucet at Cottonwood Creek where the, where the Mojave section is, Section E, I believe. And they weren't turning that on because they need all the water to go down to, to Los Angeles or whatever it goes. This year, I think it's going to be different. I think that faucet will be on because there's just so much snow up there that we shouldn't have any issues there. Um, let's see. And I'm it's actually going to go. flash flooding. You know, we get flash floods and mudslides depending upon how much water is coming off the, the hill, the mountain, you know, the Sierra. So, that's the kind of thing in the high in the high desert in the Mojave, whatever, um, that you want to kind of be aware of. So if there's tons of black clouds up on the mountains above you, and you're in a in a in a creek drainage and a draw wash, you know, dry wash, um, I would certainly be listening and anticipating and kind of be having in the back of your mind, you know, this thing could flash flood, but we don't really have too much trouble as far as flooding in the desert. 
Okay, Mike asks, does the depth increase the avalanche risk? Yeah, I answered that one somewhere below, I think. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. all right. So we'll, we'll skip over that one then. Um, Coyla says, I took part in Ned's southbound course. Learned a lot. Okay, so learned about arrest skills. Yeah, it was definitely worth the money. All right, your That's commission, cool. Ned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Let's see. I'm just going back in chronological order. Um, let's see. Jim asks, what options to resupply between Kennedy Meadows and Kearsarge is Delacour kind of out of the equation this year? I have no idea what Delacour is. Do you know what that is, Ed? Yeah, it's a ra that's a, a ranch at the base of the Horseshoe Meadows Road. We use it for a resupply point and a sort of a base camp between all of our uh, snow advance course trips. And a uh, great re uh, resource, um, but the problem will be when will the Horseshoe Meadows Road open? You know, so... It may be late, so I think the De La Cour is largely going to be out until that road gets opened up to the public, you know, this year. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. And just going in chronological order here. Yeah, there's a comment about forget the snowshoes. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. was an easier way to go back to the beginning. I got to go back up every time. Let's see. Um, DLC. Oh, okay, so you didn't answer that question. All right. Okay, Lisa, next question. Any thoughts on using mountaineering boots versus hiking boots? I've gotten frostbite on my right yeah. foot a few times, so I want to keep it warm. Good question. This came from the last webinar, so you want, you want to feel that one, Ned? Yeah, I did. Uh, I answered um, Lisa a little bit down below, but the essential thing is is that uh, mountaineering boots typically are not designed to flex. You, you can't, you know, push off your toes in the same way as, as a flexible okay. boot or, or trail runner. So. That's not the best thing to be having on your feet when you get below snow line and you're on dry trail. So um, you're changing out of your mountaineering boots into maybe trail runners or something for dry trail. So you're carrying two pairs of shoes. Uh, if that's what you want to do, that works fine. You may have even use feet crossing shoes. So uh, any kind of boot that has an edge, that's fine. But the edge is what's going to save you and a vertical heel. That's what you want to look for in a boot. Otherwise, your runners, you know, or any shoe that has a mono sole or a continuous sole where there's no vertical face to the heel, um, it's just going to turn into a ski, and it doesn't really have an edge. It's just such a soft, flexible shoe. You can twist it, so it isn't going to do well um, on steep snow. So uh, Flower Man actually brings up a really good point that we didn't really talk about. Um, it, I, I'm assuming this is an exit point. So sometimes the best option is, is to turn around and go right behind you, and that, that's a very valid yep. point depending on, depending on where you're at. Uh, let's see. Kate Huxtable Burgess asks, is a three-season tent like the Copper Spur sufficient given amount of snow and camping as close to the pass as possible? And it looks like you did answer this, Ned, but maybe you want to elaborate yep. for the others. Well, the only thing there is that keep in mind, the last several years we've had late-season snowstorms that dropped a foot or two of snow. If you've got your you know, narrow summer weight tent, I don't care if the manufacturer calls it three season. You gotta look at the design. Can I can I put my you know hand in a lot of weight? Can I stick a twenty pound weight on the top of my tent and is it gonna break the pole? You know, snow starts to pile up on top of your tent or pushes in from the side. And so if you've got a really narrow tent and it's dumping outside and it's snowing for a couple of days, can I live in this thing for a couple of days? Can I get stay inside my tent? with my pack and my stove and I'm cooking and I'm living in it, I can't get out, the wind is pushing in, the snow is pushing in from the sides and the top, it's not clearly a four-season tent or even a three-season if that's going to become a problem. So really it's till about early June. Once we get past early June, I'd probably start thinking to switch out from a, from a more durable, well-designed three-season tent to more of a summer tent, but just because of the fact we've had some pretty serious dumps in early Yeah, if, if I may interject, I, I think someone has their, their mic's not muted. I'm getting a lot of background noise, so if, if everyone can mute their phones, that'd be great. Um, we only have one other question left before we got to sign off here. It comes from Elena. So if we start this year, this year on a Sobo, what is the latest deadline we should plan to finish the trail at Campo? Uh, good question. Um, <laughs> I guess I've never really had someone ask me that question before. I well, think um, you, def you definitely want to get through the Sierra before end of September, right, Ned? You want to get through the Sierras by, by before Halloween, certainly at the latest. 
And once once you're out of the Sierras, you've only got another month to get to the border. I mean, it's not that there's a deadline. You know, you're in Southern California. Yeah, you're going to have some snow, maybe Baldy, uh, San Gabriel, San Jacinto. But once again, we're talking powder, and we're also talking pre-Thanksgiving. So get out of the Sierras by Halloween. You know, try and cruise through Southern California around Thanksgiving. You'll be fine. Yeah, an important note for the Sobos, you know, you're hitting the Southern California high desert section in probably the driest time of the year. Um, so water is going to be more of a challenge, and I highly recommend that you watch the, the PCT water se- report seminar uh, webinar that I did. You can just go to YouTube and type in PCT water, and I'll pull up all the videos that will be posted on it. And it's really important for the southbounders to send us water updates because we just don't. There's not as many hikers out there. And it's really important for the guys behind you to know what you're seeing. So please send us updates. Okay. Well, I think that answers all the questions. Um, you know, thanks everyone for joining. I, I hope it was beneficial. You know, we're trying not to scare you. We're just trying to give you all the information that you, know, you have at your fingertips to, you know, make smart and safe decisions. And yeah, you know, I, I just want to leave on the point that, you know, keep in mind if you get yourself into trouble out there, you're not only putting yourself at risk, but you're you're putting the search and rescue teams at risk too. So, so try and make, you know, keep that in mind when you're, when you're deciding, should I go on or not? Is this out of my, my, my realm of, of safety for, for my experience level? Um, every year, you know, there's people who need to be search and rescued out of the PCT. Um, you know, there's a person last year who disappeared in the, in the Washington Cascade region, um, still hasn't been found. So it's, you know, we're not trying to scare you. Just, just make smart and wise decisions. And um, we appreciate you joining. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to contact us on, contact us on Facebook or you know, send me an email at The Water Report. And I'll go ahead and close out the meeting now. So take care, everyone. Yep. Thanks for attending. All right. Goodbye.